Okay, so let's get started. So we're unmuted, CTV, we're ready to go. Okay, I'd like to call to order this meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, June 6, 2024, at 5.32 p.m. Will the secretary please call the roll? Somebody is not muted on their laptop. I'm not muted. Uh, no. Hello. 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 Person, person, person. Okay. President Hill. Here. 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 Vice, uh, Vice President Eckerman. Here. 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 And Director Fox. Here. Here. And Director Smalley is attending remotely. Here. I have a quorum. And Director Smalley, do you have anyone over the age of 18 in the room with you? No. Thank you. Okay. Um, at this time, we will ask for changes to the closed session agenda, which may only be made in accordance with California Government Code Section 54954.2, the Ralph and Brown Act, <laughs> which includes but is not limited to additions for which the need to take action is declared to have arisen after the agenda was posted as determined by two thirds vote of the Board of Directors or if less than two thirds of the members are present and unanimous vote of the members present. Do we have any changes to the closed session agenda? Seeing none, moving on. Oral communications regarding items in the closed session. This portion of the agenda is reserved for oral communications by the public for items which are on the closed session portion of the agenda. Any person may address the board of directors at this time on closed session items. Normally, presentations must not exceed three minutes in length, and individuals may only speak once during oral communications. No actions may be taken by the Board of Directors on any oral communications presented. However, the Board of Directors may request that the matter be placed on a future agenda. Please state your name and town or city of residence at the beginning of your statement for record. Mr. Holloway. I'm Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek. Uh, Randall Brown used to be a director of, of this district and one thing uh he said one time if someone tells me there's only one alternative i start looking for other alternatives so i think um i think the uh, the interim general manager isn't the right one for this district and i think that you know it in your hearts um i think you're also kind of tired of the whole process um, I think you need a plan B. You need to uh, get another recruiter working on it. You probably need a higher salary range so you attract uh, better candidates. And um, you may need a plan C um, to keep Carly from moving, following uh, Stephanie and Kendra over to uh, Scotts Valley. So. I hope you get started on, on, on an alternative. Thanks. Thank you for your input. Seeing no other members of the public present, um, we will now adjourn to closed session. CTV, we're going to leave the room and return at 6 30. Pardon? Let me unmute you. Okay. Okay. Um, go ahead and tell them to call me. All right, thanks. CTV is trying to get a hold of me or something like that. I don't know why. So do you want me to unmute this or? No, you're unmuted. You're ready to go. Okay. So I'd like to reconvene this meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for June 6th. 2024. I'll start with a report of actions taken in closed session. Uh, the board has decided to forward a draft contract for the general manager to our legal counsel for uh, completion and presentation at the August board meeting. And that's the only action we took. Okay. Uh, Changes to the agenda. Additions.
to the agenda, if any, may only be made in accordance with California Government Code Section 54954-2, Ralph M. Brown Act, which includes but is not limited to additions for which a need to take action, is declared to have arisen after the agenda was posted, as determined by a two-thirds vote of the Board of Directors, or if less than two-thirds of members are present, the unanimous vote of those present. Um, I did not take roll. Take roll. Will the secretary please take roll? <laughs> President Hill? Present. Vice President Ackerman? Here. Director Foltz? Here. Director Smalley? Here. And he's attending remotely. We've got a quorum. And we earlier determined that Director Smalley does not have anyone over the age of 18 in that room. That is correct. Okay. So, um, changes to the agenda. Does anyone have changes to the agenda? No, President. No, no changes. Excuse, um, excuse me. In, in light of our guest, is uh, could we advance anything that she's going to be speaking about to the right. start of the meeting? No, she's fine. I think it's fine. fine. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So we have a, a guest speaker here, and um, uh, Brian, would you please introduce her, and we'll proceed. Okay. This is Nikki. Uh, from Oppenheimer, who will be speaking of the debt issuance. Okay. Item. Do we have any other changes? Uh, no. Okay. Thank you. Oral communications. This portion of the agenda is reserved for oral communications by the public on any subject that lies within the jurisdiction of the district and is not on the agenda. Any person may address the Board of Directors at this time. Normally, presentations must not exceed three minutes in length. Individuals may only speak once. Please understand that the Brown Act limits what the Board can do regarding issues not on the agenda. No action or discussion on a, may occur on issues outside of those already listed on today's agenda. Any director may request that a matter raised during oral communications be placed on a future agenda. Hello, um, I'm Nicole Lunderberg. I'm with Brack and Bray, and I just want to follow up on the uh, April 18th and the May 2nd meeting. Um, the board had discussed having a working session regarding consolidation with Brack and Bray and Four Springs. Um, at the May 2nd meeting, there was action taken by the board for phase two, or phase one rather, and then at the very end of the meeting, um, there was an indication that there was some surprise about the the big basin receiver meeting. And so I really do think that this working session is really important, especially given the fact that we have over a million dollars for grab and break that we have to deal with with FEMA. And being that you are the lead agents in our letter of intent, it's important for us to work together and so we need to figure out how we do that together. Um, I'm already reaching out to Sandus as the engineer who did the design to figure out how we package up our project, but it still seems like if consolidation is really something we're gonna do, that we need to have some understanding working together on a letter of intent that the board signed off and approved. So again, I beg you to get this agendized. Thank you. Can we agendize that please for our next meeting? <laughs> um, I don't see any reason not to. Okay, so <laughs> we said two or three meetings ago that we would agendize it. Okay, so ask can staff. we... Can we do that? Why don't we ask the staff? I'm sorry? Why don't we ask the staff? Yes. Brian, would you put that on the agenda for the next uh, meeting? Uh, staff's glad to look at it to advance it. Yes. Thank you. Please okay. please do put it on the agenda. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Was that a yes, it will be on the agenda, or you'll look at we'll possibly have, putting it on the agenda? We'll have, we'll have an item to put on the agenda. So we'll have an item that would address the full strategic review of the consolidation, potential consolidation with Bracken Bray and Forest Springs. Uh, I can't confirm all of that now. Okay, so we don't have a full commitment yet to have that review, just what, so it's clear. What would the limitations be? Maybe you could share with us like what your thinking um, is. Around. It's a little awkward to say a lot of this in the public setting but we are working on it. Yeah, understand we're limited on our discussion, right. yes. but we can ask that it be put on a yes. future I agenda. I, I, kind of, so. I guess I don't, yes. I, staff would prefer to not make a commitment at this time, but we are working to advance it and as will be 
shown in some of the discussion even as much as tonight. So the board would like an item on the agenda to cover what can be covered at that time. Okay. Yes, staff can agree to that. And if it's not all complete, it's not all complete, but we, we at the very least, we need a, a detailed update. Okay. Yeah, that can certainly provide it. Thank you. Okay. Please. Good afternoon or good evening, board. My name is Tricia Weber. I'm the Santa Cruz County Clerk. And I wanted to let you know that there was a an initiative petition turned into our office that we did check under accordance with the uh, elections code. And we submitted the sufficiency of the petition to you, but too late to be on uh, discussion for this board meeting. Um, I just wanted to make an aware awareness that there was a petition. It met sufficiency and it's been forwarded to the district in order to uh, discuss. And because under the codes for uh, district initiatives, it will be on the ballot on, in November. It's automatic since it did meet the signature threshold. However, the proponents can withdraw that petition or that initiative from the uh, measure from the ballot up to August 9th if they so decide. I can answer questions about the process, but that's about it. Oh, excuse me, I have one. Bob, just to make sure I'm clear. If the board took no action, it would still be on the agenda on the November ballot, excuse me, on the November ballot. That is correct, unless the proponents withdraw. The unless they withdraw. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to request that uh, that also be agendized for our next meeting. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Other oral communications? Oh, Sorry. Excuse, excuse oh, me. Bob. So the next meeting we have is July 18th. And the deadline, I believe, is August 9th yes. to take action. So we're looking at being comfortable with 12, 21 days between our first review of this and when action, if any, would have to be taken. We're comfortable with that? Not really. I'm not comfortable no. with it at all. Um, can we also, Barbara, can you comment on process here, maybe a little bit? That was to me. No, no our no, legal our, counsel. Our, uh, our attorney was online. Yeah. yeah, I haven't had a chance to actually look at this. That was sent to. Um, I would suggest that there, you know, this is a public notice. This is this isn't agendized. This <laughs> I haven't looked at what's been provided. Um, that was sent to me. You know, what a few minutes before we started the closed session. So, generally speaking, there's there a special district under these these types of situations doesn't have a lot that can be done. Let's just say that. So I'd prefer to take a look at what's happened, provide a basic process memo to staff, and then we can go from there. So I would say that staff will advise the board on next steps. But yes, it will be, you can, we will have something on the July 18th agenda. For sure. So should we consider having a special meeting? We should consider that. I don't know that we... I wouldn't make a commitment tonight. No, not tonight, but I, we definitely should consider having a special meeting because, because there's I would a like very to, short time frame here. I would like to understand what this is as quickly as possible. Yes. Staff will inform you definitely as quickly as possible. Thank you. As soon as we know something. Yes. Yes. Sir. Uh, Eric Martin from Boulder Creek here. I just have a question for staff or engineering. Um, the May 2nd agenda shows the pump station at West Park and Ridge in one location, and previous versions of maps showed it in another version. So my short my my long question for a short answer is: Has the pump station location at that particular proposer, whether it's a done deal site, has it changed? Um, staff. So currently, the district has obtained an easement from Heart Bath Institute, and the lo proposed location is at the corner of West Park and Highway 236. Uh, West Park doesn't touch 236. Uh, I'm sorry, Ridge. 
So 236. 236 and Ridge, which yeah. is the original plan. Okay, no need to change calculations. Thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or speakers from the public? Seeing none, we will move on. Unfinished business, we have none. New business. Uh, Mr. Frost? Yes, thank you. So I'm going to let. Um, so the item is the Valley Gardens will serve. I'm not mistaken. And so I believe we have a short presentation from Robson on this. Is that correct? And then um, Garrett can say a few words or if you want, we can we can lead off and then you can give your presentation, which sure. You got me to start? Go ahead. Okay. Oh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, for the record, my name is Mark Robson. I'm the president and owner of Robeson Homes. I'm joined here this evening by my uh, daughter, who's the project manager for the Valley Gardens Project, and Scott Sally, and Andy Service from Shaf and Wheeler. Uh, he's our hydrologist. Uh, we have, uh, if you can pull the presentation up on the screen, I'd like to talk to you about the project, give you a little background on the uh, project, and we're here to answer questions that. Uh, the board and the community may have. So whoever can start it. There's a new one. There's a new one that came out this week. Just a little while. Scott, the email would have came from Molly. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I sent you the correct one yesterday. Oops. Well, I got one this afternoon. That's no, for the second item. Oh, okay. I'll hang on a minute then. Thank you. I'll begin the presentation. Uh, the cover sheet you know, are examples of our work. Uh, we've been in business for the past 35 years. Uh, building homes, neighborhoods, and uh, commercial centers and mixed-use projects like the one we're proposing at the uh, former golf course. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an aerial, and it shows the property. Uh, it's the, it's a, you can see a site. It's the former Valley Gardens golf course. On the top of the screen is Mount Hermon. Uh, you can see the uh, retail center is highlighted. Uh, Spring Lakes uh, Mobile Home Park is on the right side of the of the site, and uh, you can the yellow lines depict the water districts. A small portion of the site is in the Scotts Valley Water uh, Water District, but uh, most of the property is within the uh, San Lorenzo Valley Water District uh, service area. Next slide. This is our uh, this is our site plan. It's a uh, it's a mixed use uh, site, as I mentioned. You can see Mount Hermon on the far right of the screen, and uh, the building on Mount Hermon is uh, is the McDonald's. You may be familiar with that uh, stretch of Mount Hermon. Uh, we've got an orchard planned out front. Uh, we want to break the existing pattern on Mount Hermon from a, a design standpoint, so it's not just a 
a sea of parking with a building behind it, but it's, uh, you know, it, it more reflects the, the character of Scotts Valley, which is open space and and uh, and so forth. And as you come in, there's a there's an 8,300 square foot uh, retail center that will be comprised of three buildings, each individual buildings. We're trying to disguise the parking. And we put the uh, the retail out on open space. It will be a very unique, experiential type of retail, primarily food. And uh, residents in the uh, in the area really want uh, you know food and restaurant options. And this will be a very unique uh, aspect of that. As part of that uh, development, will be on a, a large open space with a park and and play equipment. And that park will be open to the to the public. It will be privately maintained. One of the other aspects of the development is the city. Um, as you're aware, you know, through, see throughout this, uh, throughout California, are under pressure to increase uh, housing, and one of the requirements the city has is to increase apartments. And so we added 54 apartments to the development, and there are also 142 single-family homes. And uh, one of the other interesting aspects of the development is there's a a, a multi-modal trail from the Whispering Springs area that, that comes off of Lockwood Lane. All the way through the development, through open space, and out to Mount Hermon for pedestrian and bicycle access for the whole community, so that people have a, a safe and interesting way to get through the, uh, you know, from the Whispering Pines neighborhood into uh, the commercial corridor along Mount Hermon Road. Next slide. Now this is a, a an, air, an aerial depiction of what the retail looks like, and we're trying, as I said, we're trying to, you know, we want to. Uh, focus on open space and, uh, and individual buildings, and you had a unique retail experience. Next slide. And this is the entrance off of Mount Hermon. You can see the, in this depiction, the plan is, is changing as a result of comments we've received from engineering in the city of uh, Scotts Valley. Now the open space is on the opposite side of the street, but it's the same idea where you'll come in. There'll be an orchard and there'll be retail in the rear of it, and there'll be a unique experience from an aesthetic standpoint. Next slide. This is another aspect of the retail from the ground level. You can see the, the quality of the buildings and so forth. Next slide. Uh, there'll be you know, outdoor seating. This is in between two of the buildings. There's another building to the right uh, with outdoor seating. And this is the, the first building. There's a relatively large building, about 45 square feet. And that's, you know, for a restaurant, the smaller building to the right would be ideally a coffee shop or something like that. And there's another building that would be another food use. Next slide. Uh, project highlights, uh, you know, the, the development is using a lot less water than uh, was previ previously used on the site. The golf course used about uh, 70 plus uh, acre feet of, of water. Uh, the development that we're proposing will use about 42 acre feet of potable water. We will also be using 12 acre feet of recycled water from Scotts uh, from Scotts Valley Water District. Uh, San Lorenzo Valley does not provide uh, recycled water at this point, so we'll get in our water our water from that. And the other uh, point I want to make is the majority of the potable water that is used for this and in the development will go back into and be the Scotts Valley. Uh, sewer system and will be retreated, retreated and uh, used for recycled water. So whereas previously the water that was being used for the golf course evaporated or went into the ground, this water will be reused. So from an efficiency standpoint, uh, and the use of water will be a, a huge improvement from what was previously used on the property. Another aspect of the project I think it's important is we are increasing June beetle habitat. And uh, that's another aspect that we're working with the water district on is the uh, is uh, working jointly with the San Luis Valley Water to District to uh, increase the uh, June beetle habitat. Uh, so that's another thing that we're doing. Financially, uh, there's uh, the, the two million dollars that will be uh, contributed to the habitat expansion of an existing uh, habitat area that the district currently manages. So this is something that you're already managing and will be an expansion of that that you'll need, not only to be used for this, but for other uses uh, by the district. Uh, in addition to that, there's approximately $3 million uh, of connection fees and so forth as part of the 
uh, development. Uh, lastly, uh, it is we are providing new housing, it's much needed. 29 of the homes will be uh, will be deed restricted permanently into perpetuity for affordable housing at both moderate and low income levels uh, for the community. So. Uh, the development does a lot of good things. It uses less water than it previously did, provides new housing, uh, affordable housing, uh, habitat, uh, and so forth. I think those are, are all, uh, I think, important attributes in community benefits. Uh, that concludes my prepared comments. If there's any questions from the board or the community, we're here to answer questions. Okay with the board, I'll, if we can continue with the staff, the remainder of the staff. I'm sorry. If it's okay with the board, will staff will continue with the rest of our presentation and and then. You uh, I think that's that. fine. Do you mind? Yes, please. Okay. You're, you're part of the presentation. So, thanks. We'll we'll let's save the questions till the end. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead and uh, you'd like to continue. Sure. So it's my pleasure to present the Valley Gardens Development Will Serve Letter for the board's consideration. The proposed redevelopment project offers several benefits to the community, the environment, and the San Rosa Valley Water District. Since about 1970, California has been experiencing an extended and increasing housing shortage. The proposed redevelopment of the former golf course will provide over 200 new residential units to benefit the community. While the former Valley Gardens golf course primarily operated from a well supplied from the Santa Margarita Aquifer, the housing development has the opportunity to be partially supplied with surface water from the San Lorenzo Valley Water District system, thus benefiting the aquifer and the environment. The greatest benefits will be to the San Lorenzo Valley Water District in the form of additional customers to support our system. Public water systems typically are run more efficiently when costs can be spread out over a large group of people to obtain good economics of scale. The district will receive upgrades to our existing system required to supply the development and connection fees for each new meter installation. Lastly, these additional customers will be established on the new distribution lines that require minimal to no maintenance in the near term. And with that, I'll take any questions you have on the little serve letter. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, um, I did want to, Scott, if you can bring up that one slide. Give me a second. Are we soliciting questions or we're waiting for There's a slide? A slide to that, yeah. Thank you. So I did want to, um, I'm going to have Barbara speak after me, but I, I do want to just make it clear is that essentially what we're asking is the district has an obligation to serve um, within its lap go area service area in its sphere of influence so it's in its service area within LAPCO we're required to serve that's what we do as a water district um you know like again like I said I'm gonna have council weigh in on that um but I did want to point out for the number of homes 200 homes I'm just going to reiterate what Garrett said three million dollars in connection fees million dollars in upgrades to our system um, so that and yes these are pipes that would need to be upgraded to serve the system but they're also upgraded to the level of our new master plan for instance those upgrades you see the one the dotted line right in front of there it's a 10 inch line because the master plan calls for that now and over three hundred thousand dollars a year in in usage charges so I'm just gonna, I wanna underscore that because I wish we could say that about the rest of our district that people could hand me <laughs> one whole can and it's brand new and they're gonna send me money and it doesn't need maintenance. So I just wanted to put hammer in those points and also Barbara, if you would please comment on the um, obligations of the district regarding a will serve. 
Good evening. Yes, this is Barbara Brenner, District Council. I just said, pointing out to the board that um, generally the water district, if, if the general rules uh, beyond what your own rules state is that you, you're there to serve customers within your service area. And so that's, you're not there to make land use decisions and those kind of things. But if somebody comes into your service area, you're there to provide uh, a basic public need, which is water supply. And your regs indicate it's section 306 and this this type of situation is contemplated in the latter part of 306 rule that upon receiving the application and upon compliance with other ap applicable rules and regs for locations with no existing service and meter the district will install a service connection and meter upon payment of fees designed to reimburse the district for the cost of the facilities required and so when we went through this wheel served letter, that's what it's trying to, you know, that's what it's spelling out is those costs required to serve this particular new development. That's what I, I would like, just would like to add to the presentation from staff. Thank you, Barbara. So I will just close with the one last piece is that staff did go through this with the fine tooth comb and Believe me, if there was something that could be attributable to this development staff, definitely turn that stone to make sure that it's there. Um, and that there, you know, all the connection fees are there. That's, we normally charge those because that's in addition and above because anybody would pay that connection fee. Or the system's in perfect shape, they still pay the connection fee because they're buying in to us, this whole district. They have to pay that amortized cost of everything that we have going on. So that's sort of the right to be part of the club, I guess, if you will. Um, but as Barbara also advised me, this we can charge that amount and only that amount, what's, what's fair, what's reasonable, what's justifiable. Um, and so staff did make sure that we are indeed charging what we think is fair to the district. And they're kind of reasonable. And that's, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Comments from board members? A um, <clears throat> couple of questions. Uh, the 42 acre feet of water consumption that you cited, um, and I don't know if I should be directing this question to staff or to um, the presenter, but is that inclusive of residential use when the homes are occupied? Yes. Um, we were serving the golf course, uh, before when it was in operation. No, not no, really. Not they, really. They had a well, well they had a which well. was falling out of the, um, the Santa Margarita aquifer. Okay. Um, so, so we weren't delivering that we water. We weren't delivering the water. Okay. Um, we lost, uh, <clears throat> It was roughly 200 homes in the CZU fire in our service area. Um, how many connections have been restored of the um, individuals and, and residences that were lost in the CZU? I, I, roughly, I'm not asking anybody to remember exact numbers. I, I don't have those numbers, but maybe the, the just your question is, yeah, I don't know. The hard, I mean, the heart of your question. I, I think where I'm going is that very few, to my knowledge, very few of those um, homes have been restored since mm -hmm. the fire. I mean, it's, you know, a couple yeah. dozen or something, right? So we're still mm -hmm. without all of those users who were, were mm -hmm. you know, a connection to and, and a, you know, paying a regular monthly fee for their use. Yes. Okay. Um, so that's... Those were my questions. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks. I have a, a series of questions. Um, just to make sure I'm clear on this, this has been approved by city council already. We're, you're all good to go? No, it, uh, we're, uh, the project is winding its way through the, okay, the process. city of uh, Scotts Valley zoning process, but a will serve letter is a, is a requirement as part of the zoning approvals. Okay process is the punishment. Um, 
Of the 208 units, how many are moderate and how many are low income? Just curious. And I just want to make a correction. There's 196 total units, but okay. there's, oh. there are, of those 42, I'm sorry, of the uh, 60 single family homes, there are uh, there are 12 AUs. So so they're counting those as, as extra units too, but it's... You know, it's a it's a granny flat over in a, a detached garage behind a house. So you, you get some idea. Mm -hmm. You know, like you, you've got a house and you've got a detached garage behind it. And you put a granny unit flat on top of it, a studio. So does that count as one or two in your one hundred ninety two? Well, the city the, the city can count ADUs towards their arena requirements, and so that's where that comes from. Okay, but a lot of those ADUs wind up being used for offices and. So forth, they're not necessarily rented, but it does provide a a affordable housing alternative without a deed restriction. And those twelve ADUs cover both moderate and low income. Well, no, it's just built typically because they, you know, in a, in a studio flat that is four hundred fifty square feet, they rent at pretty low rates. Uh, typically, rent with respect to the. Uh, the 29 units that will be affordable, how many are moderate, how many are are low, that's decided there's a committee comprised of commissioners and city council that will be held just prior to going to a public hearing, and the city will determine what that mix is. I don't, we'll be there and we'll talk to them about it, but the city makes that the determination. Okay, so it's 29 out of 192. Is 196. 196. Sorry, 15. A lot of a lot of different numbers here. Okay, right. got it. And that's spread across. That 15 percent is spread across both you know apartments and and the uh, and the and the for sale homes. It's a combination of rental and for sale homes. Okay. Um, are you going to be installing sprinklers in all of these units? Yeah, fire sprinklers are required. So that's a seventeen thousand dollar connection fee per unit. Correct. One ninety six. Make sure I get the right number. Times. Let's say just it's seventeen thousand plus, but three point three two million, roughly. Well, fifty four of the units are apartments. So, oh, sorry. Staff would prefer to not do detailed math calculations. So, so I, 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 have, I, have presented, I, I understand, I understand that. Presented you with the figures. I understand that, but what I'm trying to do here is be very transparent about what the value is to the community, which is making this decision. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't see what the problem is with talking about numbers. We're all friends here trying to reason together and make sure we understand what the value is here. So you're saying apartment units won't have the same dollar figure. Um, typically, when we talk about numbers, I do like to see how you arrive at those numbers. Um, that's why I did this calculation of 196 times 17,000, but we're not going to go there, apparently. Okay. Love the transparency. Well, the department units are master meters. Yeah. So they are. Well, if you rephrase your yeah. question, Director, I could answer it. Well, but I don't want to do instead of, instead instead do of detail, playing. I Instead of playing 20 detail, questions, may I please answer your question and stop interrupting me in these public settings? Brian, please. Let's, yeah, so let's, let's, let's take it down. It's, I can tell you the process we arrived at. Great. The staff does not want to do a detailed calculation on the fly without being checked and double checked the way we normally present numbers. Yeah, I'm only looking for estimates at this point just to make sure we understand what the value is to the community. And if we can't bring that kind of information to these meetings, and that makes it even more important that we have this decision spread out over two so meetings. We took connection fee, one inch connection fee times the number of homes, and then the apartments. There's two buildings, and it's two inch roughly size connection. And we sized it, we came up with roughly $3 million. Great, thank you. At today's rates. My next question is, what if the connection fees change between now and um, whenever the project eventually gets approved? Because this can be a lengthy process. Are we committing right now to these rates for them? Or yeah. if they You'll change? Really charge the connection the, rates that are at the, at the current, at the posted rates when they. Okay, so we'll need to make sure uh, that I'm looking. That's then current rates, basically. Yeah, okay, right. got it. Okay, 
Um, let's see here. Um, what is the distance um, of the upgrade pipeline on Casita Way uh, to the tie-in at Graham Hill Road? How many feet is that pipe? I think uh, Andy Sherman's name. No, the answer. What? Uh, I can look it up and see. Sorry. Give us a minute. And we'll yeah, no worries. More. So I'm looking for the distance for both yeah, of the no, pipes that you're. Yeah. Yeah, it's in the report somewhere. It'll be easier for you to find it for me for sure. Yeah, just, so. yeah we'll, we'll get we'll come we'll get to. There is a number. I've seen it. I don't want to guess though. Yeah. And the estimate that uh, it would provide of a million dollars in upgrades is consistent with what we think it is as well. Yeah, I can read on that. And while he's looking it up, the uh, work that would be done, would that be done by the district and then reimbursed by R Robeson, or is that done by Robeson under our supervision and requirements? Robeson's going to construct and we'll to our standards and supervision. Okay, so and then it's, it's my understanding though that we would do the uh, meter connections. Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I saw that. Yeah. yeah. And then there'd be the official turnover of ownership at the uh, at the end of that process once we accepted it. Okay. Um, and will there be a fee for the work associated with reviewing all of the plumbing plans for all of the structures? It says that it'll provide, but it wasn't. And then there's a general about activities, but since they were separated, I wanted to make sure that those are tied. Was the intent that we would charge? The intent is that Robeson will refund the district for any of its consultant previous. Okay. Um, the acre feet that is being added just for my benefit or and by say added i mean added to our system not added to the aquifer because i understand we're reducing the aquifer impact but adding it to our system it's about three and a half percent more or less of a 1500 acre foot year of sales that we would make um Siobhan, i saw that it was two percent but i don't have that number in well if you do a 1500 acre feet staff member we have two percent well, it would depend then on what our average uh, acre feet is, because in, in the light of the drought, we have been bouncing around at a lower number, right? And that lower number is around 1,500, 1,400, 1,600, 1,700, that sort of thing. Okay, it's, it's in the staff memo. 2% is what staff is saying. Yeah, I understand that. Um, anyway, I whether it's 2% or 3.5%, the um, the implication here is that it's not for our system as a whole a huge burden on it overall. Um, what is the pipe size from the probation tank down to Lockwood? Eight foot. Eight, it's eight. Eight and a half. Okay, and we deem that sufficiently sized to be able to handle the because it might be 3.3% for the overall district, but the percentage impact in Scotts Valley service area is larger. Yes, so is that all of, those, all of those studies systematically went to where the water was coming from and where it's going to, assuming fire, fire loads, which govern in this case. So the fire loads govern the whole design process all the way through. So we were very careful, we went through it, number of times and settle on the pipes that you see are the pipes that require an upgrade. Okay, so nothing we more nothing. Like so the, the probation tank to Lockwood eight inch, no problem. But we need bigger pipes down in the development itself, closer to development itself. And, and that's not necessarily a capacity issue as it is a velocity. I understand. Issue. Yeah, yeah. Understand. water velocity issue. Yeah, because when you start concentrating yes. versus spreading it out, I get it. Okay. 
sorry, give me a one. So yeah. the four inch pine thing to see the way is about in the model it's 460 linear feet. And then the additional pipe in uh, Lockwood Lane is about 850. 850. That's all the questions for now. I'll have some comments later. Thank you. Any other board comments, Mark? Yes, I have a few. Um, <clears throat> on page 43 of the agenda packet, uh, we see a, a comment response in uh, our consultant, Eagle and uh, Sean Often Wheeler for Robinson Homes. Um, and what we see here are Eagle's comments. Shaw's responses at the engineering and uh, environmental committee meeting. Um, I had asked, has Akel reviewed the responses and could we get something in writing from Akel saying, yes, these are acceptable. Do we have that staff? Yes, Mark, we have an email from Tony on um, September 30th. And he indicates we've reviewed the shop and memorandum. They're addressing all of our review comments. Check mark from this end. Uh, okay. All right. Um, the uh, will serve have exhibit um, that's a, a map that's September 2022. But I see in the agenda packet that you uh, then reference a an updated site plan from Robot Homes, March 2024. Is the um, 2022 map the for the will serve letter still valid? Does it need to be updated? It's been updated. Um, we have a new map, the uh, will serve exhibit dated. Uh, May 20th, 2024. Oh, okay. Um, that didn't, we didn't, that wasn't in the agenda packet, I did. Am I correct? It was added to the agenda packet on Monday. Oh, okay. I didn't see that addition then. Okay. Um, sorry about that. Um, who installs and then owns the service laterals? Because I see the document talking about all the mainline pipe, but then all of the branches going up to the meters. Director Smalley, typically the district, we we install or someone will install on our behalf everything up to the meter and including the meter. But everything right. beyond the meter, that's customer side. Right. That's, typical, that's the typical case in all of our systems. So ropes okay. in this case, they're installing all that, and that's okay. their part of the system. Good. So all of the service laterals, we pick up that also as part of it. Okay. No, no, no. No. We own up to the meters. Right. Up to oh, I'm, the I'm sorry. Okay. I'm using the wrong word then. We own up to the meters. Correct. The meters to the house. Yes. Okay. Correct. The calculations for uh, fire, water, flow, and pull uh, was to me um, on page uh, uh, I believe it was 40 I thought I saw it on 48 uh, but I see um, a figure that's being deducted from the uh, potable water flow in the table that uh, Schaff and Wheeler had put together. Was there a reason for that deduction of 
2.9? Yes. So the 2.94 acre feet per year is deducted from the potable water total because this is reclaimed water. Per the Shop and Wheeler memorandum dated May 15, 2024, mm -hmm. Table 1, Note 4, right. HOA landscape on townhome lots will use recycled water, deduct from potable demand, and add to non potable demand. So, um, was uh, is there a factor in the potable that that, that uh, is for landscaping? But since they're not going to do it for, for landscaping, is that the the reason to reduce that? Yes. Okay. Okay. And um, in this case. Why does fire water flow demand incorporate the non potable then? So the fire flow demand is potable water only. Right. Including the non potable water demand in the total for the hydraulic analysis is a conservative assumption. This gives additional demand for sizing of the distribution mains. Okay. Okay. All right. If that's a. Uh, comfortability factor in there then. Okay. All right. That's my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the public on this? Yes, sir. I, I have a question. Please. I'll be able to speak later on. I yes. have a comment that I'd like to have like three minutes on. Um, thank you. My name is Rick Moran. I'm from Ben Loman. Um, are you suggesting that 600 people are going to use 18, 18 acre feet per year, less than a nine volt golf course. That's what I'm getting out of this. And if that's the case, that nine hole golf course used a heck of a lot of water. And they weren't too concerned about conservation. I hope that this new development will be more concerned about conservation. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments from the public. Hi, Deborah Lowe from Long Pico Canyon. I had really planned to speak, but in listening to this, I really appreciate uh, Director Smoller bringing up about the ACL report. That was also my concern. If you feel that all of those concerns have been addressed, could we, as a public, see that the response from ACL? I haven't seen that in the report. I don't know if it's been public. Um, they made it very clear that the district did not have a sufficient water supply to, to support this development from what I read. So that's changed, I would like to know. Um, secondly, I don't recall, and perhaps it was in the report, if the district considered if there was going to be additional employees required to um, maintain and operate the system with this additional number of homes. I say that because in Long Pico Canyon, we we were uh, required to do a five-year surcharge to pay for additional employees when we joined the district as a merger. And that's because when Felton joined the system with its 1,200, they did not do that. They found it was very short. And my last comment is, um, Mr. Fritz, I find you your disrespect for this board and your, your sharp answers unacceptable. Um, I wish there was a better relationship. You were for the board. They're your boss. And I think that you need to, you owe them a little bit more respect in answering questions. And when, as I understand, the board has the ability to ask for something to put on the agenda, and it's not for you to argue with them about it. Thank you. Additional questions from the <laughs> public? Comments, questions? Uh, Eric Martin again, Bull Street. I think that selling the natural resources that belong to the people of the San Lorenzo Valley and their surrounding, those surrounding areas to essentially another city for money is a disservice to all of us. That every drop of water that goes in through your pipes all landed on somebody's land. It's not all your land. We, you are entrusted to take care of this resource for us, and I find it rather offensive that you're selling that resource. Thank you. 
I'm uh, Bruce Holloway from Boulder Creek, and I am mindful of what the district council said that the district is required to serve within its boundaries. Uh, so I I take that very seriously. Thank you. Any more comments from the public? Thank you. Um, there was a comment made, I just want to make it clear as a uh, Brock and Bray who's seeking consolidation. Um, Brock and Bray is in the sphere of influence for um, SLV water, and we have been paying property taxes. So I just want everyone to understand when we hopefully get to our conversation of talking about Brock and Bray who's trying to recover from the fire and Forest Springs who's trying to recover from the fire and Big Basin who are trying to recover from the fire. We, um, well, Big Basin is not in the sphere of influence, but we have been paying taxes. So I just want to make sure everyone understands. Um, the larger picture about people in this valley trying to get um, safe, reliable water, and that Brock and Brave worked really hard to get money, and we're not freeloaders. And I just want to make that very clear that we're not asking for stuff without putting a lot of time and energy into this. And we've been silenced for six months, and it's really important that we don't lose our funding from FEMA. Thank you. Any further comments from the public? Anybody online? Any online? No. Nope. Any further comments from the board? Yes. I have one, Jeff. Go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, since the question that I asked about uh, Akel's follow up response was followed up by a member of the public. Um, I would like to see that and have it distributed also. The email from confirming that all is good. Okay, so I have one comment from the board, and that is that um, it may not be widely known, but that area, along with the Whispering Pines neighborhood, has been part of this district for decades, and they all pay property tax also, including myself. So um, I appreciate your position, and I understand your issue, but I, it's not like we're talking freeloaders here. These, that property's been paying property tax for probably 40 or 50 years. Um, I personally live in the Whispering Pines neighborhood. I've been paying property tax for 35 years, something like that, um, as well as the water fees. So uh, it's not like this is not part of the district. This has been part of the district for a long time. May I? So, yes. Question, comment. Um, so uh, I, I agree. I, I think there, you know, there was a comment um, earlier that may have misunderstood that that is an existing part of the water district that we're talking about. It's a different use. That we're talking about the 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 use was a golf course, and now we're talking about um, you know uh, homes, and you know as a result that changes you know the nature of our relationship with it, which is why we're considering it. But what I wanted to know, and and Barbara, maybe this is a question for you. Um, it, you know, we do have an obligation to serve the homes that are built within our sphere of influence. So if Scotts Valley is, and, and it sounds like there's sort of a chicken and the egg issue where we have to issue the letter of service before they can approve the project, but, but if we denied service, what would Scotts Valley's recourse be um, to try and, and, you know, take that issue further? The, the city? Well, I mean, I'm assuming that that the developer, I don't know who the, the aggrieved party would be, but what would, if we were, I mean, I, and I'm not just saying that I want to do that, but I'm just trying to understand, like, what, what would happen, and that way our community can understand what our limitations may be as a board in terms of what we can do. Well, um, <laughs> I, I mean, eventually they could, they could force the issue through the court system, but what I typically see 
develop it would be the developer um what i would typically see a developer do is go political they would they would <laughs> they would create some political pressure that would be if i was representing the developer um the first step i would take is like why aren't you doing this if you have water available and they're willing to pay your fees and improve your system then on what basis are you denying them a, a service um and that that could lead to a to a to a lawsuit the other option they could have is to to seek the service from somebody else and then then that would cause perhaps LAFCO engagement, that would be the other agency that you would go to. You would go to LAFCO and say that they're denying me service unreasonably. There's a variety of avenues that they can go down. Basically it just gets very messy. Yes, yeah. thank you. Oh yeah, it, it can get very messy. Okay, so we have a comment online. Yeah. Chris Moran. Just a moment here. And who are we? Who are we? She's unmuted. Pardon? I am unmuted, yes. Yes, thank you. Hi. Please. So we're talking about community understanding. Uh, I wanted to make a comment of something that was raised earlier. So 40 out of 900 burned homes uh, from the CZU fire have been rebuilt. Thank you. CZU fire victims haven't had the chance to rebuild their homes because of the county planning department. Yet Scotts Valley Planning Department can approve this project for 600 new residents and three retail stores, while longtime residents of the valley cannot catch a break. There's something so unfair and so wrong uh, to our local friends and neighbors who have lost their home. I know that's not this board's responsibility or this water department, but there's something very wrong there. Another thing I wanted to say is about the Robesons, uh, how they're figuring the water usage from the golf course. I wish that you would stop saying that because you're saying that you're, we're saving water. Our water department never gave water to that uh, golf course. The water that comes from San Lorenzo Valley Water Des District is processed water. Theirs came from a well. So to say that this project, this current building project, is saving us water isn't correct. And so now we're going to be adding restaurants, coffee shops with kitchens and toilets for the public. This, this to me isn't concerned to serve. And finally, one more comment is that it's Mount Herman, H-E-R-M-O-N, and not Herman, like Herman, H-E-R-M-A-N, just a typographical error. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any additional comments from the board, Bob? Yeah. Um... I mean, without putting too fine a point on it, the way utility law is set up, my understanding is from having encountered this a few years ago when this first came up, was that unless we could demonstrate some absolute critical shortage of water, mm -hmm. um, we, we couldn't say no, yes. right? And while I think the community has done a great job of um, conserving water, over the last few years, we do sell about 30% less water than we used to just a decade ago, even though the population of the area has gone up slightly. So, um, which by the way is a huge testament to everybody conserving. Um, and, our, and I think the thing though that we, we aren't really wrestling with right now, and this is what I struggle with a little bit, is the fact that three out of our four surface water intakes are offline. Mm -hmm. So in fact, if we get into a drier year, fortunately the last two haven't been, but if we get into a drier year, we may very well take um, more water out of the aquifer mm -hmm. than 
we currently are doing in order to serve this, which is, I think, the bigger impact. Right now, under our emergency uh, declaration, we're able to pull water out of Fall Creek to send around the district. We're no longer operating under Fall Creek water. It has to stay in Felton. But that's, you know, we can't count on that lasting forever. So I, I think it's I think it's a little bit, um, it's a, it's a, the subtleties here are a little bit more than just, hey, it's X out of the well, it's Y here out of the system, boom, away we go. We could, in fact, again, depending on the percentage of water that this is an increase in Scotts Valley, we could be impacting our south system significantly in drier times by adding these, these people. Um, and that's something we can't take lightly. Um, you know, to me, this really gets to what I think is the heart of the matter, which if we're going to be adding people and communities to our system, which I believe we need to do, particularly our community, existing community members, we need to be figuring out a way to get beyond the, the sort of uh, endless process we have for getting perfecting our water rights. Um, which could have been done by now if Santa Cruz hadn't sort of, you know, got in the way of that. Um, because that, the ability then to be able to take water from any source and deliver it to any destination allows us to manage our surface water um, better yes. over a period of time. But I, I'm wondering here why, if any conversation had been done at staff level with figuring out a way to use this development to help partially pay for restoration of our surface water sources, which currently is about, we're down about 60% of 50%. Um, so 30% we're down basically on, a, on an annual basis. Was there any conversation or consideration around that? And it isn't that they have to pay for the whole thing, but contribute to getting that back up to speed. No, there was not because it's not it's not something that we're can attribute to the development. It's specific to the development. The development isn't causing didn't cause or isn't causing those lines to not be working. That's a FEMA disaster. So what we can charge them for, and Barbara, you can can correct me on this, but Basically, we can charge them for the upgrades necessary to serve them. Um, but not the upgrades for the supply of the water? Those aren't upgrades required for them. Those are damages to our system, which is different. And so we are collecting $3 million, which we can use any way we want towards our system, mm -hmm. whether it's Peavine or Five Mile or any of the other cash flow issues. We have along those lines with FEMA projects, but we can't. It's not an assignable. It's not assignable to can, this project directly. May I ask a question, Jeff? Are we yeah. sure? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did you? No, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just following up on that. So, um, uh, we set the connection fees, mm -hmm. um, and. A res, you know, if if a residential customer building their own house on their one acre piece of property came to us and wanted to purchase a connection to the system, right? There's a there's a certain prescribed set of fees and conditions that the the parcel has to meet, and then if they pay the connection fee and we have the water to give them, we have to provide them service. Right. Okay, so we can't, or maybe we can. I'm not a lawyer, so Barbara, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we can then treat a developer differently and say, well, we're gonna, we're gonna require you to pay for other conditions in our system. They're coming to us with a project that says, here's how many connections we have. We're saying this is what it's gonna require us to serve this project. And so I don't, I, I guess I'm just trying to understand, Bob, your question about like, how would we be able to negotiate for other items that were related to damage um, from a natural disaster for a residential customer Right? We wouldn't be able to do that with a residential customer building on a one acre parcel. So how would we be able to do that with a developer? Barbie, do you want to comment on that too a little bit? Yeah, my 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 easy response is, you know, 
capital cost, uh, broad based connect, you know, broad based system costs. Those are your connection fees, just as indicated. That that's the purpose of the connection fee. Right. And as as Brian indicated, as Mr. Press indicated. You can only attribute the costs associated with a particular project. So it, it, there, there's a lot of case law <laughs> on these things. There's actually been a lot of litigation over fees and what you can charge a developer. Um, and there's a whole body of land use law that goes towards this. And so... Um, I think I think you answered my question in broad strokes. Thanks, Barbara. Yeah. Let me let me follow up a little bit on that. Um, so if we go back to status quo ante before the fire, um, Scotts Valley would be served purely by wells, right? There would be no service coming from the North System. Um, so basically, a hundred percent of that water would would come from wells. And I don't know how long it's going to take to get this through the process, but, you know, worst case planning here, we have to assume that we may get back to a situation where Scotts Valley is served only by wells, that the emergency uh, situation we have now is lifted for one reason or another. Is the well infrastructure um, required, which, I, again, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I'm assuming these 196 homes are a much higher impact on water use in the Scotts Valley South System Service Area as a standalone unit, are, are wells part of that consideration relative to being able to serve this community? That is, do we have enough wells? Is it enough capacity? Do we draw enough water to be able to do it without any issues? Did we consider that? Um, I believe the engineering reports went into that in considerable detail, actually. That if it was standalone, not not the way we have it right now. Yes, standalone. Yes. They looked at the capacity of the wells, the capacity of the tanks, the elevations of the tanks, um, and they did not assume uh, necessarily that water was coming in from other locations. Okay. So, so that, that it's, it's worth reading the report because they they well I missed that part of it. I did read it. Yeah, they they looked through it fairly thoroughly, if I understand correctly. One other comment. I, I wanted to, um, first of all, I, I wanted to respond to Chris's comment on the line that, you know, it, it is a tragedy that so many of our um, neighbors who's lost their homes in the CZU fire have not been able to rebuild. And, you know, I, I wish that that were the case. I, I will say that um, those homes, if and when they are able to rebuild, they will be connected to our system. That's not, you know, th those homes have their connection. And so if we decide to provide a letter of service to this project, that does not preclude us in any way, shape, or form from serving those homes in the future when they rebuild. Um, and hopefully they get through that process just as soon as the county can possibly see their way through it. Um, but that I just wanted to respond to that concern. Okay. Seeing no additional comments from the board or the public, do we have anyone else online commenting? I don't see. Um, Chris has her hand up again. She's still I'm sorry, Bob? Oh, yeah. What I wanted to do is, um, th this is a really big decision for our community. In fact, yes. it, it may be outside of the consolidations, this is probably the biggest new addition that this district's gonna see for a long time, if, if ever. Um, I'd like to hold this over again to the July meeting, if that's possible to do from a legal point of view. It's a special meeting, Barbara. We can still vote in this at a special meeting. Yes, there's no problem with doing yeah. that. You can continue it. You can continue the matter until the next meeting. I'd like to give the community a little bit more time to absorb this uh, in the interest of transparency and making sure everybody understands what we're talking about here. Um, I mean, I see the value to um, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District of about four million in total, one million of infrastructure, three million in cash. Effectively, mm -hmm. that we get to apply to infrastructure, mm -hmm. I'd like to make sure that's part of the 
final motion. I'd like the community to be able to understand the water impacts uh, that we have here um, and, and make sure that everybody who might not have seen this has an opportunity to comment. And uh, I'd like to make sure that we can communicate this to the local media, put it on our social media, that sort of thing, so that people can take a look at it and really get a feel for it. Um, I, I think there might be some additional comments about conservation measures that might be taken. For example, uh, it wasn't clear to me whether the outdoor or irrigation use of each individual house was going to be on the recycled water or just the common areas. And it's basically the common areas. And could it be made each individual house be on the recycled uh, water for their irrigation purposes and the like? Um, so I think these are things that we as a community need to talk about before taking a final vote. So um can can we pose that as a as a I, question? I was gonna okay. pose that as a motion to uh Ooh. delay this to the next well, meeting. Well we don't need yeah. the we don't need a motion. We can just not take any action on it and ask staff to bring it back on July eighteenth. No, no. Or, can you comment on the process, please? Well, you can continue the matter to the next agenda. You could, as the director has indicated, you could take no action. You could you can just determine that you don't want to take any action. And it would, and then it would be, or you can direct staff that you you would like to just as indicated, put this back on the calendar. Um, it's really up to the directors. They can, also motion to, um, they can also motion to go ahead with this, or he can yes. a counter motion. It's basically a counter motion. It's the way I would understand it. He files a counter motion to delay it, and everybody votes on that first because it's the counter motion. Well, and you can. Oh. Another director can can make a motion. Can make a motion to pass the resolution. I, you know, just in the interest of being uh, community friendly and transparent and giving the community, which I think is important, uh, a chance to weigh in, um, I, you know, we don't have to make this overly formal or in any way contentious. It's just we delay this until July 18th. At that point in time, we can choose to take action. Okay. That's all. Just a moment. Scott, you were. Uh, no, just Chris still has her hand up. I thought it was Mark Smalley. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, um, I am going to move that we reschedule this issue for the agenda of the next board meeting and address it at that time. If you wish to do it as a motion, I'd second that. Yes, I move, I move that we move this issue to the next board meeting and address it at that time. And Bob has seconded it. So uh, would uh, the secretary call the roll? President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackerman? Um, no, I don't feel like I have enough information right now to make that decision either. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay. Motion passes. We will readdress this at the next board meeting. Okay, moving on on the agenda. Presentation of, we did not discuss the Valley Gardens offsite sandhill mitigation. Uh, so let's cover that. Okay, thank you, President. So um, Carly is going to color is Carly is going to present this item for the offsite sandhill mitigation. Thank you. And um, I'll follow up with some comments, and so will Harbor. CTV, can we make Jody McGraw a panelist as well? And then Scott, you have my presentation. I you pulled up earlier. Thank you. 
If you could speak into the mic more directly, please. Before we dive into the presentation, some new information has come to light to staff that I'd like to point out to both the public and board. Uh, this item is heavily tied to our market value being based in the Grant E. Sandhills Conservation Bank costs. And since this memo was published, the Zianti Conservation Bank has released new rates for 2024, increasing the cost from $4.37 to $6 per square foot. So the background information and the agreement still stand, um, but staff is recommending that we use the updated 2024 cost in the recommendation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we'll go ahead and jump into the presentation. Can you speak up a little bit? Oh, sorry, I'll try to speak up into the mic. <laughs> I'll bring it really right into the mic. <laughs> okay. So as you guys, as everyone's learned in the last presentation, Groves and Homes is pursuing a mixed residential and commercial project in Scotts Valley, known as Valley Gardens. The Valley Gardens project does have impacts on sensitive sandhills habitat, and since then, uh, Groves and Homes has been in the process of habitat conservation planning and environmental import, or sorry, environmental impact report development. Um, as part of the habitat conservation plan, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is requiring Robson Homes to mitigate for the decades, sorry, sorry, I'm getting time time, uh, the Zianti bandweed grasshopper and the Mount Hermon Jew beetle. Next slide. Uh, since then or since this um, report, Ropes and Homes has entered into an agreement for half of its needed mitigation with the Zion T. Sandhills Conservation Bank, leaving the mitigation of an additional 10 acres for the Mount Hermon June Beetle. Next slide. For some background, the Zion T. Sandhills Conservation Bank provides private property owners with requirements for mitigation offsite for any impacts to Sandhills habitat. Uh, the bank is currently made up of a 22-acre preserve in Ben Lomond, and it protects or covers three species, the Mount Hermon June Beetle, the Ben Lomond Spine Flower, and the Zanianti Van Weed Grasshopper. <coughs> the Conservation Bank at this time does not have enough credits to provide to the Valley Gardens project to cover all the mitigation needs there. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recommended that the Ropes and Homes projects approach the district for its mitigation. Next slide. The district is able to do this through its Olympia Watershed property. The Olympia Watershed property is approximately 180 acres total, and it currently has an existing Sand Hills Conservation Area of 6.3 acres. There are 73 acres available for Sand Hills Habitat ha Conservation, um, and the district, according to its own habitat conservation planning, needs 40 acres. Next slide. So as mentioned, Groves and Homes does need an additional 10 acres for the Mount Hermon June Beetle mitigation. And the district can provide this offsite mitigation at its own properties. So the district was approached in January of 2023 by Groves and Homes and has since been discussing this offsite mitigation. I'd also like to note that this is a standalone item from the will serve letter. Ropes and Homes can pursue another will serve from another agency, another water district, and we could still provide this offsite mitigation as a separate project. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So staff is recommending that the market value be based in the Zianti Sandhills Conservation Bank rate of $6 per square foot for a total payment of $2.6 million for the 10 acres of off-site mitigation. Uh, staff is recommending using the Zion T. Sandhills Conservation Rate as it's already established. It's a local cost that we can use. Um, conservation value is really hard to translate into a conservation, or sorry, a cons conservation value is very difficult to translate into monetary value. Um, appraisers typically look at the development value instead of the conservation value. Mm -hmm. So this establishes a usual and customary cost that's very defensible to both groups and homes and the U U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Brian and make some additional comments. Okay. So it wasn't clear this item. 
is independent of the well served butter. Mm -hmm. So Rubs and Homes also needs this, mm -hmm. and we can be a part of that for their development. Mm -hmm. That is, of course, if their development goes through. Um, the Mount Herman June Beetle, Herman H E R M O N. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Um, unlike unfortunate little species that's on the endangered list, federal endangered species list, endemic, endemic to about 1,500 acres, but fortunate for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District, we own some of those acres. So there is a value to them. I know that if you look at it loosely, we are also going to mitigate 40 acres. We need for our own projects, for our own reasons, and need to pony up 3 million for the same reasons. So if you look at that prorated across 10 acres, that's 775,000. Realizing that there's economies of scale, you probably could do it for a little less than that. Fish and Wildlife also wants us to do this. We like to be on good terms with Fish and Wildlife. We like to have good, as best as possible, working relationships with all these regulators. Um, I know that there was the option presented that Rumps at Homes could go out and develop their own mitigation property and shop for the property and then develop it. I don't want to speak for the folks at Rumps, but I doubt that that's not really in their wheelhouse or their main core mission. So they would probably just go shopping till they find something. Maybe Cianti comes up with the property and they can sell it. But my point is this is at first it was the 1.9 million. Now, of course it's gone up and it's now 2.6 billion. And I'm sorry that I have a chance to let our partners know this, but the issue is, is that we needed a comp like you would anything, any property. And we had a very good one within three miles to crow flies. We have this transaction they did for 10 acres at 1.9 million at the 4.37, $4.37 a square foot, which they now recently raised. And I really didn't have anything better to hang my hat on, but it's, I wanted something very solid. Now we have the comparable price and yes, the market went up, but it's the same deal. It rubs and accepts it, of course, but the speculating, base it on something more hypothetical like could we get more if they had to go out and do something i prefer to just deal with something that's solid and in front of us so hence the price but if you look at it from our standpoint if we combine the three million with another two plus million we can we know we can comfortably steward 50 acres into perpetuity do an endowment fund that the fish and wildlife sets up we put the money in the fund, the interest can fund all the maintenance that needs to be done, along with any incidental costs along the way, which is, I think, a good deal for the, the district. And so I want to leave it at that. And um, I don't know if there's any additional comments, uh, Barbara, if you wanted to make any additional comments on this. Yeah. I the only, I don't think, I think you guys have hit pretty much the, all the main points. I, I do want to emphasize that this is something that the Fish and Federal Agency is encouraging the district to do, and that I always want to do with the Fish and Wildlife or any similar federal um, agencies would like you to do. And it, it's important to keep those relationships, very positive relationships. And and it's also my understanding that they could, the Homes and Homes can go back to that to the mitigation bank that exists because they are looking at expanding to meet these demands. So I just think it's a good opportunity for the district. Um, and the, the pricing that's, you know, the estimate and, and cost, I think are very favorable to the district. Okay. Um, comments from the board, Mark. Yes. Um, on page 58 of the agenda, and maybe you addressed this question, Brian, uh, but it appears as though Robson Holmes uh, paid uh, the uh, Zayante Conservation Bank for 10.5 acres? 10 acres. 
10.5. Okay. Me. And was that at this rate of six dollars? At the rate of four thirty-seven. Oh, okay. So Zayante was able to sell them then 10.5 acres. They don't have addition. They currently do not, correct. Okay. Okay. Um, what's it going to cost the district uh, to go through uh, permits, approvals, everything else uh, for us to do this expansion that we're talking about? The expansion being uh, whether it's expanding by 40 acres, our conservation area, or by 50 acres if we're doing it um, on behalf of Robson Homes also. Um, and the permits that are, are through uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. My understanding is that we're, we're comfortable with the 3.1 million that we were gonna spend for the 40 acres. And Carly and Jody, who we also have online, could also comment on that. My understanding is that we've mm. did the math there. And so knowing that we're getting this additional amount of money for a smaller area, didn't have to do much math to, to realize that we're we're covered. Um, and it's a you know I, we're just. Yes. I thought that the three point one was for the ongoing thirty okay. years mitigation. To endowment, not the cost. Okay. Carly, do you want yes. to take that? So yeah. the endowment for the forty acres is roughly two point two million dollars. Uh, mm -hmm. And then all the additional costs, such as easement defense for the endowment, transaction costs, long-term ma management and monitoring planning, and then the actual restoration of the site adds up to about $3 million, roughly 3.1. Okay. 3.1 covers the endowment as well as the actual management costs and all the other pieces that are covered. So, so, sorry, can I? It up? So, so the $2.2 million is the endowment. Right, the payment and is the endowment. The payment endowment, and that's going to cover for 40 acres the ongoing expenses for maintenance. Mm -hmm. And it's $900,000 to get it all set up. Consulting fees, permit fees, whatever changes we need to make up front, et cetera, et cetera. And is that 900000 change if we do um, 40 acres versus 50 acres? Very slightly. What would cause it to change? The biggest change is the endowment cost, that, or how much we put into the endowment. The rest remains somewhat stagnant. Um, there's an increase, let's say, for the easement defense, we're estimated about 25,000 or 25,000 difference uh, compared to doing on our own for 40 acres versus the 50 acres. Mark, did that answer your question? Because I have a couple others. I, I believe it, it it answered that part of it, but let me follow up further on the Zayante one then. Um, to your knowledge, are they doing this similar level of mitigation aspects and um, monitoring and maintenance as it's what we would need to do? Let Jody McGraw step in here. Um, she has worked on that project lately. Okay. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Jody McGraw, for the record. Um, yeah, the, to answer your question, uh, the Zanny Sandhills Conservation Bank is, um, you know, the standards for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for mitigation sites are pretty standard. Mm -hmm. of, you know, durable protection of the habitat. So right. that's the same as what the district is contemplating here. And the Conservation Bank also established an easement um, as is being contemplated here. And then the, the Zionist Sandhills Conservation Bank established an endowment and their endowment also funds in perpetuity the ongoing management and monitoring costs for the land. So yeah, they're very comparable um, mitigation uh, projects. Okay. Not the question. Okay. Um, then my final question is, um, with with whatever is being set aside for endowments and whatever we're spending on uh, the 
30 years of mitigation and monitoring, uh, the permitting fees. What is left then for the district? That's a good question. Um, about, I mean, about. Is, is there 100,000 left? Is there essentially zero left? Um, so this comes back to negotiations with the Fish and Wildlife Service, which we haven't had. Um, so to know exactly what Fish and Wildlife will agree that needs to go into the endowment is still needing to be worked through with the service. Um, so it's hard to put a cost to that. There's the potential that some of the remaining funds could go towards another project instead of just into the endowment. But then right. we can also use that money to feed into the endowment costs that we need to pay out. So, and that might be something we can negotiate with the Fish and Wildlife Service. So is it possible then that this uh, $2.6 million figure from uh, Robinson Homes for the 10 acres is essentially a wash to to the district that we're not netting something for our overall efforts of being having enough foresight ahead of time to set aside these these acres so director Smalley, I, I think it's unlikely I mean doing the math, doing the numbers, like I said, it's like we're doing 3.1 million for 40 acres. We're adding 10 acres to that. Mm -hmm. If you look at cost of scale and on the margin, et cetera, is I, I'm right. guessing that we're coming out ahead on this. And it and there's also, you know, the other driving factors. We're coming out ahead, but we're also we're looking at it from the point of view is that you know, we're asking for market price, not a penny less, not a penny more, but market price for right. this kind of thing. Yes. But we're doing it when we combine it with the effort that we're already doing. I, I think it's yeah. fair to say I can. I, I understand the economies of scale aspect of we're doing a slightly larger area uh, at yeah. that. Okay. So then, yes, we would be netting something. We don't need to, at this point, determine how much. When do we have the negotiations with Fish and Wildlife about this concept as to what this would be? Once we finalize this agreement, we'll begin the conversations with Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. Okay. That's all the questions I have on this. Then. Thank you. Okay. Jeremy, do you have a question? Yes. Bob? I think the really key thing to keep in mind is that um, with the first item we looked at, mm -hmm. there's a lot of statutory yes. uh, requirements around that. And I have every intention of fulfilling, at least me personally, yes. fulfilling statutory requirements uh, for that. This is different. This is totally voluntary on our part. And really, at this point, we move from being statutorily required to do something to support development and growth and that sort of thing to where we are now volunteering to participate in that process. That's a very different thing to do for our community. Most of our community here is, is going to know growth areas as we're all aware. Um, and there's a lot of anti-growth and anti-contributing to growth sentiment in our community. As we saw when the discussion about the merger between Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley proposed merger came up. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at this one in a very different light. Mm -hmm. This has to be really compelling in order for me to say, yeah, you know, this is something we voluntarily go along with. So this is why, to me, the numbers are really important. Um, I, I think, Brian, your, your point about, well, if we're doing 40 acres and it's going to cost us 3.1 million, of which 2.2 million of that is endowment. If we just assume a pro rata increase in cost of going to 50 acres, then that's another half million, roughly, more or less, excluding the cost, which you said are going to be minimal, in your opinion, which, and I believe that. 
However, that's a half million dollars that if we proceed with this, we're on the hook for if they turn around and go and say, hey, Zayani now offering it to us for less, or that we're going to get a better deal or what have you. So, and no offense, I'm not, this is just business. This isn't trying to be, you know, pejorative anything, but I have to make sure that I'm not putting our community on the hook for a half million dollars if we go 50 acres and they decide not to do it. Is there a way to say, we're only going to do 40, we'll add 10, and then, but but that 10, whatever it costs us to do, they pay for plus the rate because our community cannot be in any way, shape, or form on the hook for incremental costs for those 10 acres. Right, of course. And this agreement is only going to move forward if the project is approved and they are committed to going forward with those acres. So we wouldn't commit to the 50 acres until their project's approved and moving ahead. But are we working on the 40 acres now on our never-ending HCP? Yes, we are. <laughs> and that's coming to a close? In December. December, soon, okay. Um, so okay. that's, that's a point that I think wasn't that was not clear, clear mm -hmm. because we're doing the 40 acres, whether we do the town or not. Right. Yeah. So what we're really, the only decision we have here is, is it a good deal to add the town to the 40? Well, is it a good deal to the compelling level that our community would need to see in order for us to voluntarily participate in growth? I'm not sure I follow what you're getting at here. Well, what I'm getting at is, is this value enough? I mean, our community has made it pretty clear. So it's not unanimous, obviously, but I believe a majority of our community would be against contributing to growth, whether it's in our area or, or Scotts Valley. Statutory is one thing. We have to do what the law says. This is not statutory. This is very different. And in that case, we have to be way more sensitive to what our community is looking for as representatives of the community. So I don't see that this costs our community anything, though. Uh, it's the contribution to the growth. Uh, that's a very ephemeral. <clears throat> it's not ephemeral to a lot of people in this valley if you get out and talk to folks. It is not. So that's my, that's my concern. But okay, so, so the 10 acres then, if we did it later, so let's say we finish these 40 acres in December, we're all good. We have to fund that to the tune of, we have to pay all that money right away. Doesn't that go in at a little bit at a time? And I'll ask Jody to jump in here for the actual process. So Jody, if if we get through our HCP for the 40 acres, can we then come back and offsite mitigate for the additional 10 acres with Robson? Yeah, there's um, nothing that would preclude you from doing it in a phased or sequential manner. I think we were contemplating it originally doing it in conjunction or designing it together. <laughs> there's nothing that would be from doing it sequentially. Or if we go for 50 acres, if we do it together, are we obligated to put up that money up front when it's created, or does it go in over a period of time? I believe it typically goes in when projects move ahead, but Jody, please jump in here if I'm incorrect. Yeah, we, um, the, the, that's a negotiation also with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, typically, endowments are fully funded um, at the time that land is set aside to provide that durability uh, requirement that the Fish and Wildlife Service looks for. Uh, in the past, in the current um, district uh, conservation area, the service did allow, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did allow the district to set up the endowment over time, uh, provided that it's um, implementing management and monitoring on an ongoing basis in the interim. So the reality on that is that the district has to fund some of the management and monitoring out of the budget rather than the endowment. So if you set up the endowment in advance, then the, the proceeds from the endowment will fund the management and monitoring and there'll be no additional um, budgetary costs associated with that on an annual basis. But if you delay establishment of the endowment, then you need to uh, fund the management and monitoring to the same level on an ongoing basis. Okay, yeah, that 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 makes sense. I mean, just we, well, the, the district has a bit of a cash flow issue right now, and so that's that's why I'm asking that question. Um, what I was trying to get to is that if we never use that ten acres, do we have to actually ever fund it? Right. Let's say we went ahead and put the fifty in, whatever reason it didn't happen. 
we have 10 acres sitting there, basically we're not gonna do anything with, can we not fund it effectively, right? I, I, I'm still a little bit concerned about timing and process and value and all the rest of it. I'd like to hear from the community members that are here um, for sure. And again, I think this is one, this is especially is one of those things that in my opinion, we should not decide tonight. I think the community absolutely needs to weigh in on this relative to their view of our voluntary participation in this process. Okay, so. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm not understanding the risk um, because if we're entering into an agreement with Robson for a agreed upon fee, to do the the additional mitigation work. The fee that we're asking for a much smaller piece of mitigated land is nearly the same as what we're getting for 40 acres. So I'm comfortable that the funding will be there. Um, we're conserving land that will need to be conserved as an offset, regardless of whether we decide to serve this property or not. We're not building anything, so we're not making any decisions here tonight about growth. We're deciding whether or not we want to enter into a contract with a developer to pay us millions of dollars to do some additional mitigation work that we already have to do. It feels like, you know, this is not a question that, that needs to be delayed in terms of making this decision. And so I would I would go ahead and, and uh, move this when we're ready to do that. Thank you. Do we have comments from the public on this? Yes. It's uh, still a good idea, and I'm still with Grant, and I'm still with mm -hmm. um, Back in April, when this came in front of the Environmental Committee, I asked that if we could renegotiate uh, the value of this land. I understand that a uh, natural resource such as sand hills habitat and the endangered species that live there are impossible to put a monetary value on. But we need to be able to uh, help restore that land and to mitigate the consequences of a new development in Scotts Valley. So I ask that they. Uh, try to renegotiate the price. And I'm glad to say that the staff went back and did. And uh, there's a substantial amount of money that's increased from that money that was allotted, that was talked about back in April to what is talked about now. So I'm happy to see that the staff is taking that suggestion seriously and is able to get some extra money out of that. Um, I know that uh, this, area is important to our watershed and it's also an educational area uh, to show the people the importance of the sand hills habitat so i want to encourage us to be involved in this and um i'm leery of uh, this as bob is of you know us encountering a, a future cost down in the future um but uh this is overall a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any other comments? Yeah. Just a room. Uh, Four dollars and thirty-three cents is the market price. That's the price that we have an agreement with uh Zianti. We negotiated that agreement recently. Six dollars a foot is not the is not the market, it's forty percent above market. Uh you know, if you on a per acre basis, if you look at the cost, the extra 10 acres, that's six hundred thousand dollars or sixty thousand dollars an acre. So we're buying 10 acres. So even at four dollars and thirty-three cents, it's a heck of a deal for the district. A heck of a deal. And you know, this is land that you know, I went out there to follow up on Mr. Moran's question. It was raised at the uh, at the April hearing and walked it with Jody. That property is not going to be used for anything else. It's not going to be built on. Whether someone pays something for it or nothing happens to it, it's really going to continue to be 
habitat. The only thing that's missing is, is that you're gonna is that you're not gonna have that additional money to restore it and improve it. And from a growth standpoint, you know, we're replacing poor habitat on the Valley Garden site, which is an infill site surrounded by development. It's, it was it's been developed. It doesn't generate a lot of, uh, of activity for tree beetles, and you're replacing it with excellent habitat that is going to be monitored and managed, you know, and you know for a long time. So I think it is a, you know, I think that the four dollars and thirty three cents is a, an exceptional deal. I really do. And that's the that's the contract that uh, that we that we recently made. So for what it's worth, I think that uh, anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from the public? One more comment from the board? Yes. Given what um, you'll get your chance. Given given what we just heard, um what is the per square foot in the agreement that we're now Considering in front of us, staff. It's the four dollars and thirty-seven cents per square foot. Oh, okay. So it's not the six dollars then. Okay. Right. Uh, we Carly. What's before you is the. Is the four dollars and thirty seven cents. However, staff understands that the Ziani Bank raised their prices. They now have it published at six dollars. We staff was very keen on making sure we're hanging our hat on market price. <laughs> and so, given that, we announced at the beginning that if staff was Knowing that knowledge that we know now, that is their recommended price is six dollars. I see. Okay. So and it's a matter of substituting that number in the motion. Okay. Bob, do you have a question? Um yeah, I mean uh... It doesn't sound like ropes and homes, and I'm not surprised doesn't want to, you know, eat the uh, increase. Um, I guess my question is um what basis does Ianti make this determination? I mean, for example, do they have any land right now to sell? Um, and, and but they just don't have ten acres. Um, it would end up eating the rest of the remaining credits at the bank if they were to sell the remaining. And they, they'd be totally out at that point. Right, and Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't want to see that happen because that would take it away from private landowners who are pursuing smaller projects. Right. That might be yeah, leave some inventory for all the other fill-in projects, right? Are, are they pursuing additional land to add? I believe they are. I mean, it'd be crazy not to if they want to stay, stay in business, I guess. Um, when was that deal with Zianti done for the 10 acres? Was that recent? In the last six months. So it sounds like maybe you got lucky. I don't um, think so. <laughs> I mean, and I, I don't. I mean, seriously. I mean, they, and the Zion Bank, you know, call me, Jody, you can confirm this. They want to sell me more land. Okay. For less money. And I told them no. Okay. I did. I told them no. Okay. I made it. I made an agreement verbally with the district. I'm sticking to it. Yeah. Nobody knows that. Okay. And in other words, we're not sticking to it because we're coming in at six bucks now. That's what I feel. I mean, I, look, we're all trying to reason here together, so don't feel in any way, that's shape, or form. Okay. That's, that's my we, we, are, we are not in agreement on price at this point. I, I would say so. Well, then why would we um, uh, vote on anything at this point? I, I don't want to insult them. Yes. And I also want to make sure that we're, because to me, $6 is a heck of a lot from a money point of view, is something you can go to the community with and say, we're getting substantial benefit here. Yes. Um, Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to propose that we return this issue to staff to come back with an, a 
agreement that works for both us and for Robeson and Homes. And could I also just add one other amendment? Um, putting in, um, when we're talking about who's going to do work, it should just be the district, not any individual consultant or anything like that. It's just the district handles it. I want the district to be the party, no third party beneficiaries in a contract. And when you refer to a third party, you're basically making them a third party beneficiary. So uh, I don't entirely understand that, but Barbara, maybe you could weigh in. On uh, Jody McGraw Consulting is specifically referenced in the contract. We don't need to do that. We just say the district. And then how we execute on it, if we wanted to use Jody, that's great. Otherwise, this ties us to using Jody. And there might be some reason why we needing to change this that this may happen five years from now and jody may be not doing something it's just not a good idea red wine that and send it back to staff well uh let me see here they just directed you i mean i could i mean if i could just tell you replace jody mccraw consulting <laughs> with jody mccraw's also no, this is barbara this is barbara I'll, I'll take care of that thank you mm -hmm. yeah Okay, so I'm going to move that we table this item and refer it back to staff to uh, for further negotiations with Robes and Homes. We have a second for that. I'll second that. Second. Any comments from the public or the board on this? Since we've already talked about it quite a bit, John, would you? Oh, you have a comment. Um, I'm just getting concerned that you're because now that you're to one meeting a month, that your agenda is getting really full, and that um, in April you said that you would have a working meeting of regarding consolidation, and so um, we have a deadline of August that we could potentially lose 1.25 million. Um, we're only 24 homes, and so um, that's a lot of money in the scheme of things for us to invest, and so um, I would really. Um, I think it's important that you guys discuss these things. I'm not against that. I'm just concerned about um, the consolidation um, has been kind of paralyzed for six months. And so um, I would like to see maybe another meeting happen earlier in July so we can respond <laughs> to the, um, the governor's office regarding the FEMA funding so we don't lose that money. This is precisely why I wanted so another. I fully understand. Yeah. Yes. Okay, John, would you? <laughs> Yeah, so motion, oh, the motion was made in the second, so um, President Hill. And this is to table this till the next meeting and yes. ask Great. staff to discuss with Robes and Homes. Okay. okay. President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Foltz? Yes. And Director Smalley? Yes. And votes. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Next item on the menu. Thank you. Next item on the uh, agenda is presentation of new debt financing. Mr. Bruss. Thank you, President. So I'm going to this time turn it over to Heather, uh, who's going to kick this off and then we also have the team from Oppenheimer and I believe we have two others. Can we promote those people? Are there are there two other <laughs> Dave Fama? Are we ready to go? Is it been promoted? Okay. Go ahead, Heather. Thank you. Thank, thank you, um, General Manager Chris. Good evening, Board of Directors. The action before you tonight is to direct the interim general manager to initiate the process of debt financing bringing the item back to the board in August for possible approval 
and to adopt a resolution to engage Del Rio advisors as municipal advisor, Gomes Hall as both bond council and a scope closure council and Oppenheimer and company as underwriter with such fees and expenses to be paid contingent on the successful closing of the financing and paid from the proceeds. The need for a debt service to fund capital projects was anticipated in the development of the financial plan models, which were used in the development of the updated water rates adopted in Fe February. Over the next couple of minutes, I'm going to lay out the reasons why we're at the point of, of proceeding with that assumption. The first item is FEMA, a FEMA revenue shortfall. And I'm not talking about amounts owed to us, I'm talking about actual cash. <clears throat> The 23-25 biennial budget assumed receipt of just over 16.3 million in FEMA reimbursements. Consultant hired by the district to assist with the claim filing estimates the district will receive 6.9 million in the next 13 months. A 13 month period is what concludes that biennial period. That would bring that 24 month total for FEMA to 7.5 million. This amounts to approximately 8.8 8, 8 .8 million in a revenue shortfall over the two year budget period. And again, it's not just revenue, I'm talking cash. All right. Again, FEMA projects, there's over 12 million in FEMA funded projects included in that 23 25 budget. The district must, must initially cover the costs and then seek reimbursement upon completion. That reimbursement takes time. Once that project's complete, it's not like a lot of our grants, we submit a, a reimbursement request on a monthly or a quarterly basis. When it comes to these FEMA reimbursements, the project pretty much has to be done and we then request reimbursement. And then it can take a year or two. And we still have a lot of those FEMA projects to do. And then the FEMA projects are not fully reimbursed. Some projects 75%, others 90%. And there are insufficient funds or reserves to nor current unspent bond proceeds to cover these costs. Speaking of unspent bond proceeds, as of April 30th of 2024, there were 6.4 million in unspent proceeds from the debts issued in 19 and 21. The remaining unspent bond proceeds will be fully exhausted with projects coming to a close in July and early September. A review of the projects in process and others in the five-year capital improvement plan produced a list of projects that were included in the staff memo totaling over 26 million that lacked designated funding and would be eligible for funding from the proposed issue. Staff is proposing to bring this list to the budget and finance committee for their review in July. Brack and Bray project. The timing of this funding is also crucial to protect the ability to utilize other grant funds. While the CIP includes 2.7 million in grant funds for the Brackenbrae and Forest Springs consolidation, this amount only covers a portion of the project costs. As presented at the May 2nd meeting, estimated 1.4 million in additional funding is needed to advance the first phase of the consolidation and fully utilize the grant. The grant funding agency has provisionally given a deadline extension to June of 25 to allow the project to progress. Meeting this deadline will require that the necessary funds to complete the project are available by end of August or early September. As anticipated in the rate study, staff is recommending the district begin the process to issue 
approximately 19 million in water revenue debt. The process takes about 120 days to issue and close. Time is of the essence. Our first step is to engage the financing team. Staff is recommending the selection of an experienced financing team to provide the necessary guidance and expertise to move forward on the proposed financing process. And at this time, I'd like to turn your attention to Nikki Tallman of Oppenheimer and Company to speak to the financing team, the process, and the timeline. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Good evening, board. Uh, community members. Louder, a little. Uh, pull the mic closely. Mm -hmm. A little closer. Is it on? Um, better? Yes. Yes. My name is Nikki Tolman, and I'm with Oppenheimer. Um, Oppenheimer is a bond underwriter. And so our role would be to price, market, and sell the bonds. Mm -hmm. Um, I have been in the industry for 31 years. Uh, I specialize in serving special districts, also work with cities, counties, and school districts. <clears throat> because of our work with special districts, we are um, a consultant to the California Special Districts Association. So special districts who require uh, or are interested in financing, uh, we are a consultant that serves the association members. We've worked with many of your neighbors. We've worked on two projects with Scotts Valley Water, one in 2016, one in 2021. We've also worked with the city and the county of Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz City Schools, Santa Cruz High School, San Lorenzo Valley, USD, City of Watsonville, just to name a few around the area. Um, we've worked with Heather um, up in Windsor and Healdsburg. And again, we would serve as the underwriter um, or proposed underwriter for the financing. The Bond Council and Disclosure Council proposed is Jones Hall, and I believe Dave Fama is on the Zoom. Um, he can introduce himself and his firm. Uh, lastly, the municipal advisor being recommended is Del Rio advisor, Ken Beaker. The municipal advisor, just to be clear, has a fiduciary responsibility to the district, so they serve as your fiduciary, as your financial advisor for this particular transaction. So they're allowed to start the analysis to work through the numbers and to bring a transaction back to you for your consideration um, at a later meeting. Mm -hmm. All of these services are compensated, are paid if and when bonds are issued. Mm -hmm. um, and if Dave is on the line, I'll allow him a moment here to introduce himself and the firm. Thank you, Nikki. I am on. Can, am I coming through okay uh, on the audio? Yes. Yeah, good. I'll just keep it short. Um, I'm with Jones Hall. We're a bond council firm. Um, that's all we do is, you know, municipal uh, municipal finance for um, cities, counties, special districts, and so forth. Uh, many of the uh, public agencies that Nikki mentioned, we were also involved with. Um, and we currently, you know, represent Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz County and worked with Heather in the past. Um, we're well qualified to handle um, the tasks at hand um, should you elect to proceed, and uh, we're happy to help. Nikki, I'll give it back to you. Okay, thank you. Um, next slide, please. Okay, here is um, an outline of the process should you choose to go forward. Um, here we are tonight, June 6th. Um, it is being recommended uh, that the district hire the financing team, not approve the financing. So hire the team so that we can work together to structure a financing to meet your needs and bring it back at a later date for your consideration and possible approval at that time. Um, 
after tonight, between June 10th and July 19th, we would work on drafting the legal documents that structure the transaction and drafting the preliminary official statement, which is the prospectus used to sell the bonds to the market. Agenda deadline for the next meeting is July 24th. And prior to that, we would work and present to the business and finance committee meeting. August 1st is the anticipated board meeting to approve the transaction. And at that time, if the board so chooses, it would direct staff to complete the financing given certain criteria. A rating on the debt would be sought and we would expect that to be received in early August if we stay on this course, uh, which would allow the bonds to be priced the middle of August and funds to be received for use by the district at the end of August. So this is the quickest timeline that we can proceed with um, in order to meet the district's needs. And I do wanna know that while the consultants um, under consideration for hiring tonight are paid if and when the bonds are issued, there is one fee and it's the rating agency fee that would be incurred once the rating is requested. And that could happen um, toward the end of July or after your approval at the beginning of August. So that's not something that has to be considered now, but I wanted you to know about that timing. And then I think Heather will complete uh, the presentation and we can go to the next slide. Oh. Right. Well, sorry. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I don't know. David, did you want to say anything in addition to what Nikki had said? No, I think that that was a, a great introduction. And um, if you have any questions about my firm or experience, you know, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. So I did want to just say, just kind of sum up here. Um, we made these assumptions when we started the rate study. We made the assumption that we were going to need to take out $19 million in debt in order to make our financing work. And now we're at that date. We're now at that time. And we found that actually through trying to save this grant project, the consolidation, the Brackenbrae Forest Springs consolidation, we started digging into the budget, discovered that there's the projected revenue shortfalls from FEMA, $9 million that were in the budget that, hey, we're not going to get. Um, depletion of the outstanding debt, that's coming to a close. And so we need that to keep going. Um, we need to have the funds to keep those projects going. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the desire to retain the grant funds so we can advance the mutuals and start adding people in the valley that were also ravaged by the fire. So we are saying to begin the process. And by beginning the process, I'm saying you're on the train, train's going, and we are getting messages that it's going to run out of fuel. We're asking permission to send the runner to the fuel car so they can get there in time, so you get to approve when they start shoveling the fuel and not before. They still get to approve it, but if we don't send the runner, the train could run out of fuel. So if you don't decide, we could potentially run into cash flow problems. So the critical first step, of course, is to engage the financing team, and that's gonna allow the critical funding that we need to keep going, to keep the momentum going that we do have now on the capital improvement projects. So I think with that, um, I don't know if there's any comments from legal on this, Barbara, that... I think I'll just wait and see if there's any questions at this point. Okay, thank you, council. All right, so at this juncture, I'll close and take it out for questions. So, uh, board questions, Jamie. 
Thank you. I understand what you're asking us to do, and I, I understand the urgency. Um, can you tell us more about how the, the process of selecting Oppenheimer over any other um, team to negotiate the debt? Um, so I'll go on this and then Barbara can, can also comment, but district manager has in our rules has the authority to go and directly contract with the underwriter. Um, it's a little more ambiguous when it comes to the, the, uh, the bond council. Um, and I'm sorry, I forget the title of the other municipal, municipal advisor. And so these, but all we came, came recommended, um, they typically work as a team um, and we feel comfortable advancing them that way. Um, Barbara, I don't know if you want to comment any more about the, just the, the rules, the district rules around that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if the question is about the process is more of what went into your determination to pick this team. I think it, it, the main, the main, uh, emphasis was that the, the ongoing, um, relationship with the, the special district association experience working with these folks in the past. I've also worked, and my other clients have worked with um, members of this team as well in the past. Um, the the debt management policy allows district manager to um, select the underwriter. It says specifically, and a competitive process may be used, but it's not required. So, um, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. That was okay. Other questions from the board? Yeah, get, uh, just following up on that a little bit. Um, we had done COPs back in 2019 and used a, uh, a different team. Um, was there any consideration to reuse that team given they'd be familiar with our circumstances? But again, no, not casting any aspersions on Oppenheim or anything like that, but it, it was a different team. And also, Barbara, for you, does um, does your firm have bond counsel? No, we do not have bond counsel. Uh, that's okay, a, so that's a big that's difference. That's a very, very specialized area. Yeah, no, I get that. And and one of the things that Nossam and your predecessor had was they did have bond counsel in-house. So we were able to leverage that yeah. and, and make it a little bit less expensive, I guess, because of that. Okay, that answered part of it. But I was curious, is there a reason we didn't use uh, the same team before with the uh, underwriter and the municipal um, advisor? No, I didn't consider it also, uh, or at least collectively we didn't, because as Barbara mentioned, I forgot to mention that part of the selection process was California Small Districts Association has preferred um, how would I say it's like a preferred they're, they're preferred providers type they they have a preferred consultant list and recommendation list the so California a, Special so Districts Association so they get a um, and what, what happened is we can get preferred rates through there but where we would end up is is with Oppenheimer so and that was the that was the one way that one arrow that pointed towards and the other is Heather recommended them and that's how I arrived at the conclusion and and by by preferred rate I'm we're talking about your fee effectively and that is 10 percent below market 20 percent is it the rate of the bond itself the rate of the, the rate bond of, yes or the rate of the COPs actually in yes. this case right um we are doing COP right that's yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And so because we're using Oppenheimer, the rate is four point, which is a different, unfortunately, than if we were to go out into the market in general. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, 4.15. The, the, the CSDA, um, the Special District Association, that's and uh, provides a list of consultants for special districts. Um, if the financing for special districts 
is approximately 10 million or higher, um, Oppenheimer is the firm that they will recommend to the members of the association. So they vetted the consultants um, to save time and money, if you will, for their special district clients. But there's no discount uh, beyond that, effectively, the service of just vetting. Of the, vetting the service of vetting. The bonds will be sold at the market rates at the time of issuance. That's kind of what I thought. But, yeah. if, however, if the financing amount is smaller, if it's a direct placement, which you've done before, a direct placement as well as a public offering, yes. um, the direct placement market um, is accessed through consultants through CSBA, um, and they can offer a better rate. But your financing is 10 million or more. Probably, maybe we, you know, the financing team will start work and determine, but it looks like it'll be 19 million. Um, and that market, the bonds will be marketed at the time that market rates. Okay, so just to be clear, there's no discount or any, excuse me, anything like that relative to fees or interest rates or anything like that by going with CSDA uh, recommended uh, people. Correct. Correct. Okay. All right. So we basically get the advantage of a pre-vet uh, on that, which is not insignificant. I get that. Yeah. Correct. But, but we did have other underwriter before, and they did a fabulous job, I thought, uh, for us. No offense, Correct. but, you know. It, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Actually. It's no... <laughs> I'm not offended. I'm yeah. glad to hear it. I'm glad it's... you were here. We're well served. Yeah. And they, they answered all the questions we had about you know, the interest rates, how that's going to find basis points, all that sort of thing. So we're, you know, I think I was the only one on the board at the time when, when we did that uh, on the current board that was there then. Mm -hmm. um, these rates are much higher than our previous financing, which you can imagine. A lot of things have happened since then. Um, what will be the ability to prepay this if we're able to substitute this for uh, with lower cost debt in the future? Is there any such option to do that? There will be. The standard call provision in and, the market. And what, yeah, what's the provision? Is a 10 year par call. So after 10 years, you can prepay it with no penalty. Depending on the market at the time, it may be a nine year. Park, a nine-year park call or an eight-year park call. It'll be judged at the time that the bonds are priced similar to what happened when you issued COPs in 21. Yeah, we did have a call provision, but I think it was out 10 years, as you as you said, yeah. I'd expect that. Yeah, okay. Um, not that interest rates will necessarily go back to where they, <laughs> where they were under current uh, monetary policy, but um, there we go. Um, okay. Um, the question, the other question I had was um, relative to cash flow. So, am I understanding correctly that this money raised would be used exclusively for the items listed on page seventy-two? Sorry, it doesn't have a number, so I'm I'm looking at the right uh, the PDF number uh, that are listed as FEMA projects. No, the, the idea is that the money is all entirely for CIPs. And what we plan to do because we still, because we have a few months is take it to the, take it to the budget and finance committee and vet which projects would move forward with the 19 million because the list is 26 million. And so we can only fund 19 million of them is beside vet those projects but yes it's all cips and yes fema work and, and any other projects that we want to put on there and i'm also going to advocate that we also fund the brackenbury forest springs project well let, let, let's put a, put a pin in that for a minute i just want to make sure i understand here so first of all i don't know why that wouldn't go to engineering committee for review of the actual projects and priorities because we should be using those off the ACL uh, study, and they're the engineering guys relative to what's a priority. From a budgeting point of view, I get that it's finance, but I don't know why we wouldn't include engineering in that. I, I think both committees would be advisable. Yeah. And then in terms of in terms of getting FEMA money back, 
we would need to complete the FEMA projects, right? I mean, we're not going to get anything back unless we complete these 16, 18, 8, uh, looks like 19 million just in FEMA projects. Heather, wasn't there $12 million in FEMA projects? <clears throat> I'm just looking at the numbers here. And uh, what, what I did was I literally looked at the five-year CIP mm -hmm. and I went through, I took out the projects that were already in the CIP that were completed, projects that are listed there, and um, with the original funding source is listed there as well. It's the original funding source. And those, those are the projects that at this point don't have funding. And so I think it would be up to the committees to determine which one of the projects would get, what projects would be prioritized for the um, new bond funds. Well, I, I don't necessarily know about that because if we're looking at 19 million that has FEMA designation and we can't get reimbursement for all of those until we complete the project, right. well, why would we not do that? I I completely agree. I think it's um it's about it's I think the project the projects that are chosen to be done need to truly be strategically done for a couple of reasons, whether it's to preserve grant funding or it's to do exactly what you said about um doing the FEMA so that we can get reimbursed and then with that reimbursed money do other projects. So I I don't want to anticipate or or second guess what our engineering staff or our grant management staff would assume would need to be done first. But I think that's where the committees would come into play, taking those items into consideration. Okay, now I do know one item on here, the Lion slide repair from 2017, which is listed at 10 million. Are we still planning and spending that kind of money given the reroute of the, um, the rerouting that's gonna be done of the road? And I think I, that I can say sorry. this about the projects is we're not deciding the project list tonight. We're just starting to decide that we're going to go out that we know that we have the funding gap and we need to fulfill it. Now the ranking of the projects we can do through the committees and then bring it back with the approval of the financing. But I to speak to like the actual shuffling, how the deck gets shuffled. And I know that it's, a, my understanding is there's less, my understanding was that the FINA projects isn't the only issue. The other issues is that we're actually just running out of our current debt, um, debt vehicles so that we're gonna be out of money around July, August anyway. And we have to be, to take on the new debt. But it's not, in other words, it's not all FEMA, it's not all FEMA money. Yes, that's how we would prioritize it. But again, we're not deciding that tonight either, how we're going to prioritize that What we're deciding is select the team, send the messenger up to the fuel car. Okay, so I, I, I get the I get the analogy, but I'm looking at the fee buying supply. I think that number seems low, ten ten thousand three hundred eight dollars or I mean it. I mean, have we finished p line at this point? There is still, that is just the excess funding needed. There is still some funding that okay. is allocated in the in the debt proceeds for that. That's just the excess that, that okay. are, won't okay. be. Okay. So and and regarding the other projects, those are literally just the projects in the CIPs, in the five-year CIP that hasn't changed since the budget was adopted. So again, I think it needs to be reviewed by engineering staff and the committees. Yeah, definitely around some of the estimates too. The last thing I wanted to talk about was the Brack and Bray um, uh, situation. Uh, assuming that we spend um, all the grant money and this additional two million, does that consolidate Brack and Bray? No. What is the term of our grant relative to what we have to do with the money? Do we have to consolidate a district? Or, excuse me, a mutual. So the issue was. This is there is a fuse on the grant money, and we've talked to the grant manager. Right now, they're provisionally willing to extend the deadline. And currently, I believe the deadline was December. Yeah, December. This so there's no way that we, even if we awarded today, we would not have it built by December. Like, 
So the idea was he did extend it, but we're going to meet after this meeting because I said, well, the idea is, is we're going to start the whole financing process. So if we can have financing in August, we could have plans on the street in the meantime and be able to award in September, October-ish. We could meet the June deadline, which possibly could even be farther, but I don't want to give give something hypothetical. So the idea there is, yes, we're saying the $2 million gets us a step closer on the consolidation. It allows us to use all of the grant money plus a little bit of our money and advance that first phase of the project. Well, it's a little bit more than a little bit of our money. And if it doesn't get to the goal of consolidating a mutual, I don't know that we fulfilled the terms of our grant. I'd have to see that. I've asked for that before. I'd have to see that language well, we, to do actually, that. Actually, that's staff's purview and responsibility, and we have gone over this with the grant manager, and they are okay provisionally that we are advancing at least as much of the project as we can, provided we're going to put in some of our own funds. We can decide, and again, remember, you're not deciding this tonight, Director Foles. You're not deciding this, but I am putting, I mean, I am putting this forward because I want to make advances on that consolidation. I would like to see that we do that. And, but you could decide at the later meeting that you don't want to award it at all. Well, that can be decided in the committee that they don't want to prioritize that project. And, and then the board can vote on it and say, no, we're not going to, we're not going to vote on it. Tonight, we're starting the financing process. Well, and this ties into why I've wanted for, for almost three months now, a re strategic review of Brackenbrae so we can figure out where we really are at the end of this process. You know, there were two things that were important to me. One is consolidate. Two is no impact to current, um, uh, current uh, SLVWD community. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've achieved either one of those yet, even after spending $5 million, $5.7 million. But I, I get that that can be a discussion for another day, which I hope we have very shortly. We owe it to the Bracken Bray community to do that. Okay. Um, okay, I think that covered all my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Art, did you have any questions? Um, my questions have been asked and answered by others. Um, I do want to concur with that list of projects that we were just discussing um, should be discussed by both the engineering staff and committee and by budget and finance staff and committees. So I do want to concur on that. And, and if I may also add with updated estimates or recoding, yes. for example, that looks like um, a number that I was given by James in 2019. <coughs> I, I'm sure it's double that now. Okay, um, Jamie, did you have any other comments? comments from the public? Um, so the district borrowed $15 million five years ago and borrowed another $15 million over three years ago. And um, I've been concerned for a couple of years that that money hasn't gotten spent. And now we're hearing, well, it may finally be exhausted. I, I've been looking forward to all that money being exhausted because um, school districts tell me they don't borrow money for, you know, and don't, they don't borrow money for capital investments and take five years to spend the money. I've asked three different school districts and they say, oh, we would never do that. Um, one of the things I've noticed about these two loans, we borrowed $30 million, but according to the payment schedule, um, about $4 million of principal has already been, been paid, paid back. So in other words, we borrowed 30, paid back four, and and we haven't even spent the money yet. So any any um, any system like this where you borrow money and take five years to spend it, you're going to wind up paying back millions of dollars before you ever use the money. And that just makes me wonder, why not borrow less? Um, 
By the way, I noticed the financing team stands to make a million bucks, whether it's over a million bucks, whether it's uh, 20 year bonds or 30 year bonds, they're going to make a million bucks by doing something. Um, and then we're going to be paying the bill for the rest of our natural lives. 20 or 30 years is the rest of my natural life. Um, the $8.8 .8 million <coughs> shortfall in, in FEMA reimbursements, um, that's not going to take, it, I don't know how long it's going to take for FEMA to pay that, but it's not going to take 20 or 30 years. So I'm wondering, are there any alternatives uh, where you can get short-term uh, bridge financing instead of uh, going for this long-term financing? Um, I think you're going to always be in this situation if you're borrowing against future assets. I noticed that uh, Scotts Valley School District borrowed six million dollars this year, uh, and they borrowed against Vine Hill School, which is an existing asset. So that decouples uh, the asset that you're using as collateral from the projects that you're doing. But if if you're always borrowing to do future projects, it does take five years to do projects in this district. Um, and I, I don't think you should repeat the same problem that, that, that has occurred in these last two, uh, two borrowings. Uh, so I would say do less, cut it in half, and then do another financing in, in three years. Um, or find some bridge financing that's more short term. Um, and, and the financing plan shows that this money won't be spent until at least 2028 at the earliest. Thank you. Any further comments from public or the board? Okay, so. There's a hand up on the. Yeah, oh, do we have a hand up? Yeah, Karen. Karen. Okay. Hi, my name is Karen Vitale, and I'm a director on the board at the Four Springs organization. And uh, I'm going to take the comments regarding the urgency of uh, funding Bra the project to consolidate Brackenbrae to also be applicable to our neighborhood. Um, I'd like to really emphasize the urgency of putting together a financing mechanism to enable the utilization of the grant funding already committed to the consolidation project. We're on the cusp of losing this funding since construction of the necessary improvements has not even gone out to bid, yet alone been completed. Um, loss of the funding plus that committed to Brackenbrae by FEMA due to well understood cash flow problems is devastating to our community. For Forest Springs, these delays reach deep into our community. We, our water system is failing. And we are now in life support, scrambling to find funding to keep it alive. This includes dipping into reserves to deal with emergency repairs. We can continue to be without adequate fire hydrants. And those were included in the phase one project. And fire rebuilders are now personally facing expenses of about $50,000 per home to install 10,000 gallons of water storage tanks on hydrants on each of our properties. I can't emphasize that this, this has to move forward quickly. And I understand the board needs to take measured steps to do that, but I strongly advocate that decision-making proceeds rapidly so we can ensure this funding doesn't just disappear. Just a second here. Okay, seeing no other comments. Bob? This is one of the reasons why I desperately want to have what what uh, she just said is one of the reasons why I def desperately want to have this strategic conversation. The funds in the grant are not sufficient to consolidate mm -hmm. either organization. Yes. 
And one of the boundaries we put around this is the San Lorenzo Valley Water District was not going on, asking its existing customers to fund that. So we need to figure out a way to have that conversation and have it fast and have it in a very candid way so that we can reason together and come to a conclusion about how we want to handle it. I don't want to take grant money if we can't execute on the intention of the grant, even if we're given a whole pass by the granting authority. It doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, I, I think you've already spoken on this issue. Well, yeah, we're doing um, public comments. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I wasn't going to speak, I was going to try to say. No, go ahead. My, I just want to Part stress. of my policy is, my personal policy is everybody gets to talk, so go ahead. Okay, I'll make it short. All I wanted to say is that the Department of Water Resources grant has the potential to impact the consolidation. If you look at your map up here, you can see where the missing infrastructure is. You, you just did an inner tie with Brack and Bray, and we are receiving enough water pressure. And so really what we need to be looking at is how do we make the consolidation with the FEMA money work to get to a formal consolidation with SLB while utilizing that um, SLB um, Department of Resource Water Resources grant. And that is the conversation I really want to have. I want to have that thoughtful discussion about how do we best use that money. I have sat here during the letter of intent, and I understand that we do not want to put any costs on the backbones of existing SLB customers, but we need to have a discussion about how we're using these two existing funding sources to get the most out of them to actually move the ball down the field. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, do we have any other comments? I don't see any. I don't have a comment, but I would like to move this motion. Yes, please. Do. So I, I, I am moving that we direct the interim general manager to initiate the process of debt financing and bring the item back to the district board at the August 1st meeting for approval. I am confident that those negotiations will provide us with more information along the lines of the things that have been raised by members of the public and the director tonight. Further to that, I, I am recommending that we adopt a resolution to engage Del Rio Advisors LLC as Municipal Advisor Jones Hall is both uh, and Municipal Advisor Jones Hall is both bond counsel and disclosure counsel and Oppenheimer as underwriter with such fees and expenses to be contingent on the successful closing of the financing and paid from the proceeds thereof. Second. Are there any comments about the motion? Seeing none from the board or the public, will you please take the uh, roll? Hello, President Hill. Yes. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Foltz. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Unanimously passed. Thank you. Okay. Moving on, committee appointments, discussion and possible action by the board regarding appointments to the administration, budget and finance, engineering and environmental committees. So this is really an opportunity for you to decide at this time if you, given you're down one board member, you want to fill them at this time, or you can also decide that you don't want to fill them. So committee, there's the one committee absence at the moment, which is budget and finance, I believe, the scales. Yes, budget and seat on there, it's up for discussion. Um, I would like to fill that particular seat, but I do not have a candidate for it at this time. Um, so I will go out, we will go out and look for candidates. Um, it's entirely possible that we won't, might not get it filled until we've Fill the board vacancy, the board seat vacancy that we have. Uh, so that's something to consider also. So that's that's where I stand. I don't. So every everybody's resigned from the budget committee. No, committee. but Dale has, and we only have one board member. It's me. I don't budget committee. We have citizens, but we don't have. We only have one board member. Okay. Well. Normally, we're supposed to have two, right? So, Can you speak yeah. up, please? Sorry, uh, we're supposed to have two. Yes, so I need to appoint someone. Can you do that? That's what we're talking about here. Um, 
I mean, happen. especially given given what we're talking yes. about here with budget committee needing to review this stuff, it seems so not good. I will nominate you. Okay. okay. Second to nomination. That's a, that's a long way around to asking, yes. Jeff. Sorry. <laughs> yes, it's been vacant for a while. No one has stood up and said, "I want to be on it." So. Oh well, here's the thing. The reason no one did that, I think, is because it is the president's prerogative yes. to bring forth who they want to have on it, and then we get to either agree or not agree. So I personally was waiting for you. Oh. Well, okay. So here we are. After you, Alphonse. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. So that so one. I, I. So wait. We have to vote. You have nominated Bob. Is that what's happened now? You nominated Bob uh, to vote. I. That doesn't have to be voted. Yes, it I, does. I yes, it does. <laughs> it does. Oh. So, for example, Mark and Jamie may not want me on. Okay. So. Give me a second, then. Somebody. I. I will second your nomination for Bob to the Budget and Finance Committee. Any comments from the rest of the board? Any comments from the citizens? The, the staff memo said the item was to pick a chair for the Budget and Finance Committee, but the board policy manual that's included in the packet says that committees pick their own chairs. That so, is correct. Uh, I think what's really going on here is that uh, President Hill is on the committee, and he's already the president of this board, and so he doesn't want to be the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee. And so, and, and the chair has to be a board member. And so this board member will become the de facto chair. Yes. Of, of the what will end up happening, I'm sure. Gail was the chair, right? So I'm Gail assuming was it was a yes. typo carried over from yes. a, was yeah, a staff report. So, so <clears throat> if nominated... <laughs> I shall not run it. For the I shall not serve. Right? Okay. okay. What else do we have? We, we do need to vote on it. We need vote. Vote. Yes, we need a vote. We have. So we do have a motion and we have a second. So, President Hill? Um, we have a motion that Bob be appointed to the. How do you vote? How do, you vote? How do I vote? Yes. yes. <laughs> Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smalley? After so much. Uh, attempting to be polite to each other, gentlemen. Uh, yes, I concur with what you have motioned. <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, Mark. <laughs> All right, unanimously pass. Okay. So the next item on the agenda is um, appears to be the consent agenda. I have four to pull. I'm sorry. I have four I wish to pull for four questions. Pull. Okay. Uh, 11 B, E, F, and G. 11 B, E, F, and G? Yeah, B is in Bravo. Okay. E, Echo, F, Foxtrot, okay. G, Golf. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, Mr. Holloway, you have I a conference. A and I. Um, you can suggest that, but so our policy does not allow. I will pull A and I as well. <clears throat> okay. So, can we can we move the rest of the? Is there anything left on the consent yeah. agenda? Yes. Okay. C and D. And C, H. D, and H. It looks like are still there. Yep. So I will move uh, items C, D, and H on the consent agenda. Second. Okay. Let's vote. Yes. President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. All right, those unanimously pass. We've got 11C, 11D, and 11H. Okay, so does staff want to start addressing these? Um, I'll just go ahead and open it to questions. Do you have any questions on the items? We can go one down the list. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to hear from, so, from Bruce. Sorry. Um, this is this is Barbara. You should. You should take each item that's been pulled at a time. So, 
in order for the for the record to be clear, you you pulled eleven item eleven A. So that's yep. what's before the board now. Right. Okay. Okay. So. So. Can we hear from Mr. Holloway? Yes, Mr. Mr. Holloway. Thanks. Um, yeah, I want to. The uh, there was an attachment D in the packet, and it's a form to be filled out with the elections department, and it has um, space for incumbents, name of incumbent, and one of the names is Gail Mayhood. Uh, Gail Mayhood has resigned her seat. Yes. She's no longer an incumbent. Um, that form has a signature and a date on it. When to me, when there's a signature and a date, the information should be accurate as of that date. And the date is today. And Director Mayhood is not an incumbent. Um, one of the reasons that this might matter is because Section 10,516 of the Elections Code says that if an incumbent doesn't file for re election, then the filing period is extended by five days. Okay. And if you put down Gail Mayhood as an incumbent, they may be waiting down there in Santa Cruz to see whether she files, and it really doesn't matter because she's not an incumbent. So I think the form should say they could pay it and not her name. Good catch, and I would request that um, staff correct the form and they file. I have another question. Given that we're likely to appoint a new a uh, person, or at least that's the plan, even though that appointment will take place roughly within two or three weeks of the candidate filing period opening, mm -hmm. which seems interesting. Um, that person would then be entitled to run as an appointed incumbent. Yes. Um, does that matter from an election code point of view relative to the filing period? Council, do you want to take that, Barbara? I'm trying to follow the question. What what are you what are you asking? So the elected incumbent, Gail Mahood, is no longer on the board. There will be an appointed incumbent, probably selected in July. Um, I believe we have to do that before August sometime in order to beat the um the 60 day deadline. Right. But given that that July 18th date is, I believe, within a week or two, maybe three of the candidate filing period for elections, the seat would be up in November. And that person would typically be able to run as an appointed incumbent. Will that impact the file, the deadline for the filing period? For who? For whoever's running for the seat in November, because at that point we will have two incumbents once again. <clears throat> uh, I, off the top of my head, I'm not sure. I would have to go back to the election code. Or we can, go, or we can go talk to the clerk. Um, yeah, you can ask the clerk. I would have to go back and, and double check to make sure, but I don't think so. I would double check too that the appointed person would be considered an incumbent. Oh no, that that is I, I know that one for sure. If they're appointed, they get to put on their um yes. candidate statement a, appointed incumbent. I yes. believe Jeff has direct I experience did, I for did that. Exactly that. Right. Yes. Yeah, so okay. I know that I know that for sure. Um, I, I guess the timing of Gail's um, resignation was such that it pushed it up pretty close to the point at, at which she we couldn't have appointed somebody. I mean, it's like within, it's got to be within days yes. of that. Yes, happening. yes, so, but I think it. But I don't think that changes any of the other deadlines. Yeah, I think it does. I think it does. I, I, well, I, I would have to take a look at the election code. Okay, okay. That, that's fine. That's the only question I had in this one. Thank you. Mr. Smalley. I wanted to follow up on the suggestion. Let's just check with the county elections office and proceed with this item tonight. Yes. Okay. The staff will make the offer that 
we will just make the correction on attachment B and also validate with the elections office. Any timing issues? Any timing issues. Remember, mm -hmm. one is filing for the election thing, the other one is someone actually filing for the office. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Two so different, different things. Questions. Get this filed. Yeah, but they are entwined relative to the deadline. Okay. Okay. One. Do we need to move that in order to? Yes. So I'll move the that we proceed. I don't have it in front of me because on my computer. We we have to move item A. Yes. Yeah. Item A with corrections. With. Yeah, with the proviso that staff will follow up to confirm that one, Gail Mayhood is no longer the incumbent, and two, whether or not this timeline will impact the um, filings date for election. Okay, so. so I'm moving it. Okay. Second. And okay. I'll second it. All right. Take a vote. President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. And Director Smalley? Yes. Unanimously passes with corrections. Num to B. Who had who was B. pulling B? Me. Okay, so you take the lead since you pulled it. Okay. Um, you know, there's been um, a lot of complaints about the uh, plating and paving done by Monterey Peninsula Engineering on social media. And I've encountered myself since I drive Irwin Way. Um, it says here uh, additional paving. Uh, we're going to do a lot of additional paving. Where is that paving going to take place? Um, I, so, could, I didn't see it in here. Yeah, so the county encroachment permit requires full width paving on Irwin Way, Payone Drive, and Redwood Drive. Additionally, any instances where the standard T cap paving results in a seam on the wheel path or results in less than two feet of existing pavement remaining at the road's edge requires additional paving width. District staff performed a pavement walk with the contractor, county encroachment inspector, and Caltrans permit inspector to determine the actual limits of paving based on the as-built pipeline installation. Where exactly is this additional paving taking place? Oh, okay. So, um, for the for the project, bidders were instructed that full width paving is only required if the county puts that requirement in the encroachment permit. Otherwise, standard trench repaving shall apply. So the county permit does require full width paving on Irwin Way, Payone Drive, and Redwood Drive as in the encroachment permit. I, I get that. Okay. So there's additional paving for $135,720. Where is that paving taking place? Irwin Way, oh, Payone Drive. So that wasn't in the original <laughs> bid? Yeah. Full width paving is only required if the county puts the requirement in the encroachment permit. Bidders were instructed. Hold a second. Sure. So that that requirement was not known before we went to bid that Correct. they had to do Irwin Way and all Correct. that? Correct. When did the county tell us that? When we got the encroachment permit. And we usually get those after we go to bid? Well, so what you should do is you should get the plans together. Then you set a meeting with the county, show them what you're proposing, and then they can let you know what the encroachment permit is going to say. Okay. We didn't do that in this case. Okay, got it, got it. We okay. assumed the T-cap repaving for all trenches. Okay. And that additional paving would be paid for under that um, additional AC paving um, bid item that we have in the bid. Okay, so I didn't I didn't understand that. Oh, okay. I, I thought the Irwin Way was already included, and we had no. additional paving on top of that. Yeah, okay. the bids are all based on a T-paving. T okay, so in the future, what I'm hearing is that the process will be modified to make sure that we understand what the paving requirements are before we go to bed. Agreed, yes. Okay, good. And I can tell you why the county wants it. They just got done repaving Irwin Way for the first time in the 35, 37 years that I've lived here. So, and we chewed it up literally within a year after they did it. So that's that's why they're uh, being kind of uh, stringent about it. Okay, great, I'm done, thank you. So okay. only one question. Um, 
when did we end up pulling these encroachment permits and things? When was this? This was this was been some time ago, wasn't it? Um, let's see. So on February 2nd, 2023, the board directed the district manager to enter into a contract with Monterey. Okay, so we're well over a year ago. Yeah, February 2nd, 2023. Yeah, so you're, you're cleaning up stuff that was done well yeah, over a year yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, no, that's what I yeah. understood too. Yeah. That's okay. why they're going to fix it all. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so Bob, since you pulled it, do you want to move for... Yeah, I move that we direct the interim general manager to execute contract change orders six, seven, eight, and nine for payment to Monterey Peninsula Engineering as part of District's Line and Big Steel improvement projects in the amount of one hundred seventy-six thousand one hundred and ten dollars. Second. Right. Okay. Take a vote. Do we need to go to comments? Just the comments question. from the from the public or the board. Thank you. All right. Vote. President Hill. Yes. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Folks. Yes. And Director Spelling. Yes. Unanimously passes. Okay. Okay. Now we're moving on to um, item E. Item e, e, the Robinson. Page 178, let me get to that. 178. Okay, this is the consulting grant writer contract. Carly, can you fill us in on this? I, I just have a question, very, very simple. So it says that it was fully expensed by April, 2023. So is this 35,000 for work she's already done or work she is going to do? It's for both. So it's to cover the period between the April expense date until we finalize a new contract, which she hasn't had many hours. We are working on a water smart AMI meter replacement grant, uh, but she hasn't really started yet. I've been collecting all the background. For her. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think the activity, the pipeline seems to have fallen off a little bit. And I was kind of wondering why this might be part of that. Um, Okay, and just FYI, I mean, from my point of view, the return on investment on her work has been stunningly uh, marvelous. <laughs> marvelous, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, we ought to look at her funding and what time she can put on this relative to other things that we might have a high priority uh, for. Grant funding comes and goes. And right now we're still, I think, a little bit in at least some, and I want to take advantage of that as much as we can. So even if we went up to, you know, 35 from 35 to 40 or 45, I think the return on investment's still worth it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Bob, would you move the yep. I move that the board of directors direct the interim general manager to execute an amendment to the agreement for professional services with Susan Robinson for consulting grant writing services. To increase the amount by additional thirty-five thousand. Second. Do we need to go to the public? I'm sorry. Public comment. Yes. Comments from the public. Comments from the board. Thank you. Let's move forward. Okay. President Hill. Yes. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Paul. Yes. And Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Unanimously passes. Okay, and the next one on the list also mine. is award of design for DWR tank replacement, and that's also Bob's. Uh, some questions. Did this go to the engineering committee for review? No. Uh, what was the amount of the other bid? And who was it? Uh, the other bid was from Sandus in the amount of approximately $450,000. Okay, that's a substantial difference, like almost two hundred and almost $220,000. Why are we 
I mean, Sandus has done work for us in the past. They're well known. They do good work. What? Why would we not go with them? I believe we. Your decision was based on qualifications. Is that, that not correct? Yeah, we based it on qualifications. Well, I mean, saying that we should be stopping all work with Sandus then, because if they're not qualified to do this. How can they be qualified to do any other work for us? I, I don't understand that. But we base the the individual proposals based on the project itself. So we have two proposals. So we're not basing it on Sandus's performance on any other job mm -hmm. as much as we're basing it on what we have in front of us. Sandus, MME. Those were the two proposals and we look at those and we say, okay, based on qualifications, we still think we're gonna get a better product from this, this organization. That's a lot of money. Uh, that is a ton of money. And I, I mean, Sandus's work has been good. I, I, this one I don't understand. This is the kind of conversation that would have taken place in an engineering committee meeting, and we might have gotten additional information. I, I get for almost a quarter million dollars, I can't support this. Anyway, that's all I had. Okay. We hear from Mark. So, was there I, a Mark? I, I I agree with that for. Two hundred and twenty thousand. I, I want to see more on your evaluation of to justify that much of a difference. And, and I understand the staff has done that. Um, in prior years, I've been involved in looking at staff's evaluation to see that. Okay, here's why we're doing this contractor. Uh, Two hundred twenty thousand. Yes, I, I I agree with Bob on that. Jamie, I, I mean, I I think I would take the recommendation of both engineering committee members um, mm -hmm. if they're both uncomfortable with the. I'm saying I would take the recommendation of the engineering committee members if they're uncomfortable with the process at this point. Yes. So maybe I could add a few things here. So we have a schedule that we do want to meet. And staff is, when you're evaluating consultants, it's not a bid. We're not evaluating them on the dollar amount. If one was double the other one, we might consider it. And in this case, in both <coughs> cases, we actually got them both to come down on their price. The consensus among staff is both of them are too expensive. Consensus is we don't have enough staff to do it ourselves, but we are wanting to advance the project. If you handed us these proposals again, we would come up with the same conclusion. And in terms of Sandus's performance, I'll reserve comment on that. But in the past, but here we are. And MME did a far more thorough job in terms of their background, et cetera. And a lot of times you're complaining about $100,000 here and 50,000 there on these projects. And what is this project supposed to cost us? $5 million, roughly in grant funds. And if we run out of grant funds, well, it's gonna come out of the district po po pockets to drive it home. So when we're basing on qualifications, we're saying, well, hey, this, contractor or this consultant can do a good job and maybe not have so many of those mistakes that are costing us this, this kind of money. So 200,000 on 5 million, I could see that being made up easily and changing. Could, could I respond? Yes, please. So um, I hear what you're saying and, and the bureaucratic process of government is long and, and I'm sure you know that better than anyone given your history. 
What I would recommend in the future, if you if you have an urgent item and you cannot bring it to the committee, um, as would typically happen, why are you not having one-on-one -on -one conversations with the chair of the committee at least so that some of these questions can get answered? Because I think it's valid for the board to say, if you believe that that Emney has better qualifications to do this work than Sandis, then so, somehow that information needs to be aired to the board, right? So that we understand your thinking rather than just take our word for it. This, this company we've hired repeatedly in the past is good enough, is not good enough to do this particular project, even though they've been good enough on all of these other projects. So I hear what you're saying. Um, I think that you can streamline this process in the forward with, in, in the future with a little more outreach to the board. And that could help to expedite some of these things when it needs to happen. Okay. So uh, staff definitely understands that. <coughs> I don't disagree. I agree. The other issue that came up with this for me is um, why only two consultants? Yeah. That was my biggest complaint. Wasn't that the price, you know, up above the price, et cetera, but we only had two. Why not 10? Why not seven? And which kind of streamlines the decision process, really, is we came down to these two. It's like, well, one of them has a lot of work from us right now. And the other one, it's like, that's also, there's the idea of being able to spread work around to the competent people that are competent. And I've often had the same people put in proposals for the same project and pick different ones for different reasons each time based on their qualification. In this case, I mean, it's it's picking the consultant. We're not awarding the contract yet. And certainly we're going to have a project update in the Engineering and Environmental Committee on this project. But this is so noted. And obviously we'd like to wash these things through, but this one sat for a while and we wanted to make sure that we get along. So the last thing I want to do is lose grant money. So the time of the essence on these projects, is there any significant difference in the completion time we would expect between these two consultants? I don't have an indication one way or the other, Garrett. I don't know if you do. No, I don't think I I think they could complete the project at the same time. Okay. However, I mean one is more local. You know, so sometimes it's like for one, it's a 15 minute drive up to the valley, mm -hmm. the other one, it's an hour and a half trip from the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. I think Santa's has opened a, a satellite office in Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the timing is essentially the same with these two guys. Um, quality of work. Uh, well, as we said, I mean, we, we rank we rank MME higher based on the qualification for this proposal. Bob? I mean, I, I heard uh, a while ago in the same meeting that we're running out of cash. A quarter million here, a quarter million there, it adds up. And um, I, I understand the viewpoint of quarter million out of five million but it still adds up and unless there's some really significant reason why sandus shouldn't be used I, I get that it didn't go to bed and i do by the way want to express a lot of appreciation for negotiation big thumbs up on that because that is something that is um i think relatively new to us um but that's that's just too much money i mean i i, I can't support it tonight that's all if we had two meetings a month, we might be able to address it quicker. But since we don't do that anymore, here we are. And I, this, these are all the reasons why I oppose going to one meeting a month. And while I still oppose it, I think it's, we tried this once before a long time ago, and exactly the same thing happened as is happening now. So...
but someone else can make a motion. That's, okay. That's fine. Let me get to that page here. That is, where am I here? Which one is that? That's 11A. 11F. 11F. Uh, DWR tank replacement. This is on page 209 of the agenda. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Do you want to make the motion, Mark? No. Yeah. I'm not comfortable with this either. Okay. 120,000. <laughs> okay. So I am going to recommend a motion. Board directs the interim general manager to execute a professional services agreement with Sandus for design of the DWR tank replacement project in an amount not to exceed how much was the Sandus bid? Um, I really, as a staff member, I cannot comply with that. Well, you're out of your lane now. Oh, I think, uh, I think we need to either send it back to staff. Yes. So you cannot, you cannot gerrymander our decision process. Okay. Please, you're, please. So we'll not when I have to put my foot down. Then I will move that we send this to, this particular item back to staff. We don't have to move. Yeah. Send it back to staff for a review. And, and, and Brian's right. Yep. Okay, geez, it gave me on the wall. Next item is Caltrans gave me on the wall. Yeah, that was um, that was mine as well. Yep. Um, okay, so I heard earlier we're running out of money. Um, I don't see this on the CIP list before. Um, is this like, how much money do we have? Where's exactly what bucket is this coming out of? Is this coming out of our operating margin? Is it coming out of the 15 million? Because when we say reserves, that's a very promiscuous term. I understand money's fungible, but we still have buckets that we manage to. So, which where is it coming from? Heather, are you still on the line? I don't know that she is. Hmm. No. No. So my conversation with Heather loosely was that because I looked at that and I asked the same question and for the amount of money we're talking about, we could cover it. Um, so it's not it's not a significant amount enough of amount of money that we couldn't take care of it. I believe the amount was what. It's here 227 and, and 942. You know, and this was not previously budgeted, and we're almost out of cash. So, I, the juxtaposition of the earlier agenda item with this one, if, again, a quarter million here, a quarter million there, pretty soon it's real money. I don't understand how we can say, in one hand, we're out of money, and in the other hand, we can drop another 250,000. I get that we're probably forced to do this because it's Highway 9. But we, we're, we're, these are mixed messages that are going out into the community and certainly a mixed message coming to me. And I would like to see uh, in the future, I would like it to be specified how we are funding these things if we are this close to running out of cash. So in this case, the driver is cooperation with Caltrans. I get, I get it. Yeah. I know we got to do it, but it, it just, it's, it's too easy and too blithe just to say, oh, it's out of reserves. I, no. Well, it wasn't that careless at all. But there was a conversation. I, I get there was, didn't come through. I still don't know where it's coming from. I'm taking it on faith. My understanding is money that we have the, mo the money in reserves. Okay, again, when we use the word reserves, we have to be careful about reserves versus fake reserves. Reserves are the actual cash that we build up we can use for anything. Reserves that are from debt financing are not reserves. That is debt financing. 
It's very like, different we, things. It's, we didn't we're, we didn't get into any of that here. But that is very different things. But I understand that what you're trying to say. You said that many times in these meetings, but this is not the issue tonight. It is the issue where it's going to be funded from. But we are, but I am telling you, it's coming from reserves, and I did have that conversation okay. with the finance director. Okay, I can't, I, again, I, I will probably be the only one that can't accept it, but I can't accept that kind of general statement. It doesn't work under a capital budgeting regime. Then I'd like to make a motion on this one. That the board direct the interim general manager to execute an emergency contract with Anderson Pacific Engineering Construction for the relocation of the existing pipeline within Highway 9 near um, mile marker 1220 12 in accordance with Caltrans project uh, 05 1Q 080 in the amount not to exceed. 227,942 and authorize the interim general manager to execute non substantive modifications as necessary. Second. Go to the public. Comments from the public, comments from the board. No further comments. Okay. Call the roll. President Hill? Yes. Vice President Ackerman? Yes. Director Fultz? No. And Director Smelly. Yes. Okay. Passes. I think the next one might have been Bruce's. Excuse me. Is next one I pulled, but I would like to hear from Bruce. Yeah. That's okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the minutes. I, um, I, I did not attend the May 2nd meeting, but I watched it on video. And I did attend the May 21st meeting. So the first thing is, I was confused in, in real time when I saw the video and when I attended the May 21st meeting. I was confused by the reports out of closed session because they both say that Brian's contract was extended by two months. So because I was confused when I heard, I heard this in real time, I emailed Jeff uh, for some clarification, and he explained to me uh, Brian's contract was for six months and one day, which ended, the original contract ended on May 21st, and he said that on May 2nd, the board voted uh, to extend his contract by two months, but Brian did not accept it. Brian did not accept the offer until May 21st. That's what I think I understand. That's, that's was my um, so it is confusing in the minutes that both reports say extended by two months. So I can't, it, you, it, you can't tell by reading the minutes uh, that it was extended to July, and it almost sounds like it was also extended until September. Uh, so, and, but I, I will stipulate that what is in the minutes was exactly what was said in the report out of closed session. So those reports were confusing, and it's the minutes didn't clear it up at all. So I will request that we make a change on that in the minutes. But again, Wait. I'll say that it, the minutes do accurately request, uh, do accurately reflect what what was stated. Um, the other thing about the minutes is that the, um, the May 2nd minutes talk about the proclamation for the uh, district secretary who recently retired, uh, but it, the minutes do not show that there was a vote. And there was a vote. Uh, at about nine minutes into the video, Jeff said, board vote. And by 10 minutes, all five members had voted. And Jeff said, it's unanimous. So that's what's in the video. Board vote, unanimous. And there's nothing in the minutes about the vote. I think I might understand a little bit why this is, but I have never seen it. In more than 10 years of following local government, I've never seen that there was a vote taken and it's not reflected in the minutes or vice versa. Um, and if if anybody wants to vote for those, approve those minutes that don't show the vote, then I question your integrity because there was a vote and it should be reflected in the minutes. Thank you. Are there any further comments? Bob? Um, I think there's two paths forward. 
One is to return them and bring them back on the consent agenda at a future mm -hmm. date, which might be the easiest thing, yes. rather than attempting to try to craft something in real time right now. Amen. Yes. So that's what I'd recommend. So we're just there... sending them back to staff then. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We'll note the correction items that need to be corrected. We will return them to the district secretary for uh, corrections. And I think that we need to indicate what needs to be corrected because I, I think that we need to include the vote in the minutes. Mm -hmm. I think um, the the pedantic point that Mr. Holiday was Holloway was, was making was that you sort of minorly misspoke as yes. coming out of the and I don't know that staff can correct that. So, yeah. so I will provide her with the words I thought I said. Well, I can review the uh, video and see. Yes, I can do that. Okay. Um, district reports, none. Committee reports. Do we have any committee reports? No. Oh. No written communications, no informational material. Unless there's anything else, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you all. I know.